four, five, six. They're coming through okay? Yeah, there you go. Okay, cool. Hello, one, two, three, testing, four, five, six. Is it working? Is mine working? I'm not sure. I can't tell. Okay.
Welcome everyone, so glad you're here. Thanks for being here in person or via the live stream. Uh, we are glad to have you as part of our Christian Life Conference and this Saturday seminar, which is one of the features that we try to build in when we plan this year by year, uh, is uh, to have a Saturday time with a little bit more concentration with an outside guest. We're so pleased today uh, and then again tomorrow uh, to have Mark and Beth Dalby with us. Uh, Mark is the president of Covenant Seminary, uh, and I talked a little bit about some of uh, the many connections that many of us have with, you know, with Mike and, uh, and Sam and I and Mark and all these different connections. So I tried to introduce him a little bit in our pastor's letter uh, to y'all, and you'll, uh, inter he'll introduce, be introduced more again tomorrow. Uh, his wife, Beth, has two theological degrees uh, from Covenant Theological Seminary, uh, and together they have parented three children uh, and 11 grandchildren right now. Uh, and so uh, lots of experience, both in real-life parenting, but also in teaching. Uh, for over 20 years, they've taught our grace-centered parenting class at Covenant Seminary, uh, and have taught generations of students uh, how to parent well uh, in the light of the gospel. So I'm so pleased that they are here with us. Uh, and just like a class, uh, after I pray, uh, they're going to run things. Uh, so in terms of Q&As and breaks and all the rest, uh, they'll be running things from there. Uh, but we are excited to have them here and grateful that you are here as well. Let me go ahead and pray, uh, and we'll begin. Father, thank you. Thank you for your goodness to us as your people. Uh, thank you that you make covenant promises to us to be a God to us and our children after us. Uh, thank you that you promise to show mercy to thousands of generations of those who love you and follow after you. And so, Lord, we do pray uh, that as we come aside to think about how you care for the generations in our families and indeed in your church, uh, we pray that you would give us wisdom and insight, pour out your spirit on the Dalbies, we pray, and grant them your grace. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, thank you for having us. It's a, it's a privilege and a delight to be able to come and be with Sean and Sarah and connect with the Malones and Sam. And um, last time I was here um, was after John Sartell had left and when you were in an interim and uh, had a chance to to preach and that was uh, I like the I like the new look of the worship space here that's exciting um, we're uh, looking forward to to sharing from our own hearts and lives and experience um, today and a little bit tomorrow um, and I guess I would say at the beginning I want to establish that there are no perfect families okay uh, I think sometimes we strive to be that and think that we are uh, falling short and we do all kinds of things to convince ourselves and others that we have it all together. And that's actually a denial of the gospel. The gospel-centered parenting we're going to try to talk about recognizes that we continually, as parents or as grandparents, need the gospel as much or more than our children or grandchildren were trying to influence with the gospel. So hopefully, if you don't remember anything else and you get up and left right now, uh, you could hold on to that, okay? Um, we're going to do this in a couple of sections um, as advertised. God's covenantal and multi-generational design for families in sort of what will be a first half. And then raising our children in the nurture and admonition of the Lord challenges and opportunities. Now will be the second half. So we'll go for a while. We'll open it up for plenty of Q&A time, take a little break, and then do round two. Okay? So uh, Beth's going to start out just telling you a little bit about our family, and um, okay. then we'll go from there. Mark and I both were born to parents um, in the pastorate. Uh, our dads were both Presbyterian pastors, and we met in college, and um, we have three grown and married children now and um, so we raised our children initially we were at Geneva College in Pennsylvania so so Mark was in the Bible department there but we moved to Cincinnati in 1984 and our children our oldest Stephen was five our daughter Kristen was three and our son Eric was just a, a newborn he was six weeks old um, anyway so maybe Kristen was two and a half but anyway 
So young children going into the pastorate and um, going into the pastorate for me was a, was a struggle because I grew up in it and I wasn't sure I really wanted to go back into it, but <laughs> God leads as God leads, and he did. And so um, as we had three very active and young children, we went to a church that had 12 families and one single guy. So it was a, it was a church replant, a restart, you could say, and all of the people that were there were the leadership of the church, and the church had gone through a split. And so, um, anyway, so all of these families seemed to have just two children. We were, there was one other family in the church that had three children. So, as you know, three children really throws you off. And if you have an odd number of children, it does get messy sometimes. Um, so anyway, so all of these perfect families with two children, and they were all well-behaved. Our children, however, were not. So they were just being kids. And um, anyway, but we had a lot of expectation that people put upon us. We had a lot of expectations we put upon ourselves. So we made it through. We survived. We um, started a Christian school there um, and just put in, a, we rolled up our sleeves and did a heck of a lot of work and our children were right there beside us and we made lots and lots of mistakes and there was a whole lot of stress in our home then we moved to Richmond Indiana we followed the Malones and our kids were in those middle years and two of our children graduated from high school there and then we moved to St. Louis uh, in 1999 and our two olders were in college and our youngest was starting a sophomore year of high school so um so they've met married spouses from all of those experiences, mostly from St. Louis. And we've been at the seminary for 21 years now and mm -hmm. um, teaching and helping to train pastors and their wives and families. And it's been a, a joy and it's, been a, it's just been a real interesting experience that, that God has led. So here we are. Now we have 11 grandchildren. Our daughter has six of those 11. Our oldest son has three and our youngest son has two little girls. Mm -hmm. And we are very actively involved in their lives too. And the grandchildren range from 14 years old to two years old. Uh, Kristen, who has six, uh, has, a four, has the 14 year old and the two year old. And uh, five girls and one boy in that family. And of our 11 grandchildren, eight of them are girls. I grew up with two brothers and no sisters. We did have a daughter, but uh, we're surrounded by girls, and that's, uh, <laughs> that's a lot of fun. I guess the Malones understand that, too, don't they? Yeah. Um, so what we want to do, um, let me just make a few introductory comments before we go. We're going to be looking first at Psalm 78. Um, and I think it's important for us to establish that loving our children is loving them for who they are and not for what they will do to make us look good or at least keep us from looking bad. Uh, parenting is not about us, it's about our children and how God can use us um, to shape their lives. And I think we have to do it from the posture of how much we need Christ and how dependent we are on Him. That comes through to our children. If that is not obvious in word and deed in our lives, uh, that perhaps is the most significant way that they're robbed of being able to understand and experience the gospel of God's saving grace and God's uh, transforming grace. Um, behavior flows out of relationship. And so the importance of uh, recognizing, uh, in many ways, uh, focusing on their hearts, focusing on the relationship we have with them, which is actually simply patterning what we do with our children the way we are parented by our Heavenly Father. Um, so we are to image Him in all kinds of ways, and one of the ways that we image Him is in how we parent in relationship to how He, he parents us, and we'll be going into more of that uh, later. So part of, as recipients of the grace of God, um, we have opportunity to model not only godliness, but repentance. Um, we are to model how to love patiently, and we are to remind our children um, of the unconditional love of God for us and for them 
in the Lord Jesus Christ. So um, this is a love that allows our children uh, to fail, to fall short. It's a love that enters into their world in the way we communicate with them according to the different stages uh, of their development. Um, and it's within the framework of the power of the gospel at work in the home. Um, anything good that happens is because of the empowering and grace of God in our lives. Um, and anything that bad that happens is able to be met by the ongoing redeeming love of Christ and the gospel um, for our children. So let's look at Psalm 78 um, for starters. It's actually a very long psalm. <clears throat> I'm not going to read all 72 verses, <clears throat> but I am going to read the first uh, eight verses. It says, Give ear, O my people, to my teaching. Incline your ears to the words of my mouth. I will open my mouth in a parable. I will utter dark sayings from of old, things that we have heard and known that our fathers have told us. We will not hide them from their children, but tell to the coming generation the glorious deeds of the Lord and his might and the wonders that he has done. He established a testimony in Jacob and appointed a law in Israel, which he commanded our fathers to teach to their children that the next generation might know them, the children yet unborn, and arise and tell them to their children so that they should set their hope in God and forget not the works of God, but keep his commandments, and that they should not be like their fathers, a stubborn and rebellious generation, a generation whose heart was not steadfast, whose spirit was not faithful. Now, a couple things in this passage. One is there are four generations in view. Our fathers, us, our children, and children yet to be born to them. Okay? So you see here this covenant understanding of family and of the people of God um, that God has established for us. And the goal here is that our children and the generations after us in an ongoing way, verse 4, would tell the glorious deeds of the Lord, his might, and the wonders he has done. So we'll see this again when we look at Deuteronomy 6. There's this remembering what God has done for us and making sure our children and their children and the children after them understand the great redemptive work of God for his people. Now, the other thing is uh, in verse, uh, let's see, 7, and the other thing we're hoping for here is that our children and their children and their children after them and so on would set their hope in God. And here it is again, and not forget the works of God. There's this remember, remember, remember that's all through the scriptures. It's what the, the frequent celebration of the Lord's Supper is. Remember what God has done. That's the starting point, in my opinion, for uh, what the Bible teaches um, about parenting. Now, the interesting thing about this passage is uh, it mentions there in verse 8, the stubborn and rebellious generations whose heart was not steadfast. Now, if you read through the rest of this psalm from verses 9 through, um, let's see, about to 67, you'll see this repeated theme of, yet they sin still more against him, rebelling against the Most High in the desert. Therefore, when the Lord heard, he was full of wrath because they did not believe in God and did not trust in his saving power. Um, and it goes on and on. It says, in spite of all this, God's patience with them, they still sinned. Despite his wonders, they did not believe. So this is the rest of this psalm is basically saying, here's the history of the people of God up to this point. Rebellious, don't believe in God, don't remember what he's done, turn away from him. And so the admonition at the beginning is to say to the parents who are hearing this word and at the time that it's written in for us today is, okay, let's look to God. 
let's teach the most important things and model that in relationship to our children so that they're not like their father. So if, if you ever wondered where, whether this generational plan of God had any bumps and bruises along the way, uh, here's a good summary. Um, it's the history of Israel is not only of God's faithful loving of his people and providing for us and ultimately sending Jesus, but the history of the people of God is also the rebellion of the people of God whom God has set his love upon. And so we have an opportunity, and I think this is, this is always the struggle, particularly in the seminary, seminary context, because you have seminary students who come from multiple generations of believer, believing families, um, and you have some who were converted in college, and they come to seminary, and they get married, and they have kids, and they have nothing from their background in their families of origin that would be a modeling or an experience of that in their lives. But the good news of the gospel is, um, whether you're a Philippian jailer in the New Testament that in, is encountered by the Apostle Paul, is there's always opportunity to start a covenantal believing family with a new generation of people who come to Christ and then immediately have responsibility for the coming generations. And there's hope in the family system that you come from, even if it was a believing family for many generations, um, that God can put, can bring his, the healing power of the gospel into those patterns of sin that get, we don't have to work hard to make our patterns of sin go to the next generation. That happens pretty much on its own. But we need the powerful grace of the gospel in our lives to see that the good work of what God's Spirit is doing and overcoming patterns of sin in our lives and, and the way we've been impacted, that this generational movement um, of God's design and plan uh, can go forward. One of the things that I was struck by this passage and thinking about parenting, that is, we as parents, I think our role is to to raise our children to become citizens of not America, but of heaven. And so we are going to be living eternally in the presence of Jesus Christ, our King. And so that's our, that's our role, that's our job, to prepare citizens of heaven. And we fail, so it's in the power of the Holy Spirit, of course, but that, that idea struck me too. Uh, why don't you talk a little bit about the, mm. the genogram? Okay. Yeah. When I was doing my internship for, for my uh, master's in counseling, uh, one of the tools that we use, maybe the third week in, in, a, in counseling relationships, is to do what is called a genogram. I don't know if any of you have ever heard of it, but what it is is a mapping out of your family history. So you do your, your grandparents and their family, you do your parents and their family, and you do your, fam your current family. Um, and you list all of the people in, in the family, all the occupations, all of the notorious personalities, and there are plenty of notorious personalities in each family system. And so what, it, what you want to be able to see is uh, eventually as you list these people, you list the occupations, you list events, you list traumas, um, anything that has happened that has um, made an impression in, the, in that person's life. And pretty soon a pattern begins to emerge. And I remember one time doing a genogram with one of my clients and we were tracing all of these generational patterns and she realized that in every generation um, there was sexual abuse. And when that moment hit her, it, you know, it brought forth tons of tears, but it also was very eye-opening to see that she could break that generational pattern. So that's what a genogram is and that's what that's what we use to help people see mm -hmm. what the family patterns are. And if you look at Psalm 78 as the family of Israel, this is sort of a genogram of uh, what God's hope is, but what all those sin patterns are that keep emerging one generation after another. And when you look at toward the end, uh, in, in the context of, of this uh, passage and the history of redemption, uh, it says... In verse 68, God chose the tribe of Judah, Mount Zion, which he loves. He built his sanctuary like the high heavens, like the earth, which he has founded forever. 
He chose David his servant and took him from the sheepfolds, from following the nursing ewes he brought him to shepherd Jacob his people, Israel his inheritance. With upright heart he shepherded them and guided them with his skillful hand. Now we know the story of David's family too, and it's the genogram of David's got some issues <laughs> as well. But there is God setting upon in his covenant with David um, the coming ultimately of Christ as the one who would shepherd his people and be the source of being able to overcome the sin patterns that go from generation to generation. And one of the beautiful things, and Sean ref, you know, sort of alluded to it in his um, opening prayer right out of the Ten Commandments, you know, the curse going to the third and fourth generation, but God's love and faithfulness going to a thousand generations, which is telling us that the comparative power of sin at work in a family, which is real and must be accounted for, but the power of the redeeming work of God in Christ in the gospel is way more powerful and way more lasting and ultimately eternally um, lasting in that context. Now, one of the things that Beth and I had to, to learn um, as we began to look at, at uh, family history, and for those of you who have married children, um, there's nothing more disruptive to family life than bringing, and, and whatever your genogram and history of your family situation is, than bringing in a whole new other. It's sort of like the coronavirus right now, you know, you sort of try to keep, and, and then something comes in, and all of a sudden you've got way more bigger problems. I know that wasn't correct English, but at any rate. Um, so what, what did we discover? Well, my, my father was a Presbyterian pastor, and his father was an elder in a Presbyterian church. Uh, and so I've got a couple generations there of, you know, elders and pastors from a Presbyterian family. And then, then you look at Beth's genogram in family history. Her, her father, her grandfather, two uncles, two cousins, two brothers, and now husband and father-in-law, all Presbyterian pastors. <laughs> that's why I didn't want to go into it. She made a vow she'd never marry a pastor. <laughs> and I said, Beth, that's a rash and unbiblical vow. And you need to repent of that and marry me. I should have married a plumber. <laughs> <laughs> or a butcher or a baker or something else. <laughs> anyway, most days she's glad she did, I think. But uh, at any rate. So what is the sin pattern in our family? And as these families come together, the sin pattern for us is needing to be received and affirmed and understood as a pastor's family who has it all together. And so we work like crazy. I mean, one of the things that, you know, Beth, Beth mentioned, you know, the family and the church in Cincinnati, you know, it was like um, <clears throat> all these, I mean, I like to say this, not only was the uh, personality Myers-Briggs type of the church, ISTJ, Every single person in the church, it seemed, had, was ISTJ, okay? <laughs> Except for us. But, uh, so um, it, it was really hard. I mean, I remember having one of the elders come to me basically saying, um, you know, the elders had been discussing, and he was the one that was deputized to come and talk to me about, you know, how unruly our children were. Well, they, they didn't have any other preschool children in the church at the time. <laughs> And, and I had a six-week-old baby, so... Yeah. You know. And I'm, you know, up front preaching, and she's trying to manage, you know, all of, the, all of that situation. And one of the elders, you know, decided that he would help out by having our oldest, Stephen, who was the most fidgety of our children, and is still a bit fidgety in church at age 41. Um, but uh, that's true, and he, he would admit that. Um, uh, have him sit with their family and their teenage boy. Um, at the time, which was a big help. And he was a principal of a high school, and, you know, Stephen sort of knew he needed to... So it, it worked. He would it was, ping it was Stephen a, on the ear. Instead of, <laughs> instead of... why, Instead of viewing us and being critical, this is where the covenant family can come alongside of one another. Uh, or, a, you know, a single mom comes into the church we pastored in Richmond um, for the first time with several little children, um, didn't know much about church, and her children, some of them were beyond the age of what was acceptable in the nursery. So do you bend the rule of letting a couple a little bit older than nursery age kids be in the nursery? 
Um, how do you come alongside of this person or do you say, I'm sorry, you're, you know, sit, it's sort of like sit over here, be warm and filled, you know, while we're all over here and, and that sort of thing. So how do we help one another is another, it's not the main point of our, of our conversation today, but I think the covenant family coming alongside of one another is part of what God uses to enable this nurturing of our children and to break some of those um, patterns um, that are there. Okay, um, let's look at uh, Deuteronomy 6. We, uh, we usually do this course at the seminary over a Friday night for three hours and a Saturday for eight hours. So we're going to be working really hard <laughs> to keep it moving and not go all the places we would normally go. And so that's, uh, that's a challenge for me even when I have eight hours. So, um, so let's look at Deuteronomy 6 for a moment. Um, I'll read... Um, yeah, I'll read the, you, you'll see some similar things to, to Psalm 78 here as well, I think. Now, this is the commandment, the statutes and the rules that the Lord your God command me to teach you, that you may do them in the land to which you are going over to possess it, that you may fear the Lord your God, you and your son and your son's son. There you see that again, that multiple generations. By keeping all his statutes and his commandments, which I command you all the days of your life and your days may be long, hear therefore, O Israel, and be careful to do them, that it may go well with you and that you may multiply greatly as the Lord, the God of your fathers, has promised you in a land flowing with milk and honey. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your might. And these words that I command you today shall be on your heart. And you shall teach them diligently to your children. You shall talk of them when you sit in your house, when you walk by the way, and when you lie down, and when you rise. You shall bind them as a sign on your hand, and they shall be as frontlets between your eyes. You shall write them on the doorpost of your house and on your gates. And when the Lord your God brings you into the land that he swore to your fathers, to Abraham, to Isaac, and to Jacob, to give you with great and good cities that you did not build, and houses full of good things that you did not fill, and cisterns that you did not dig, and vineyards and olive trees that you did not plant. And when you eat and are full, then take care lest you forget the Lord who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of slavery. And then going, skipping over to 20, when your son asks you in time to come, what is the meaning of the testimonies and the statutes and the rules that the Lord our God has commanded you? Then you shall say to your son, we were Pharaoh's slaves in Egypt and the Lord brought us out of Egypt with a mighty hand and the Lord showed signs and wonders great and grievous against Egypt and against Pharaoh and all his household before our eyes and he brought us out from there that he might bring us in and give us the land that he swore to give to our fathers. And the Lord commanded us to do all these statutes, to fear the Lord our God for our good always, that he might preserve us alive and as we are this day. And it will be righteousness for us if we are careful to do all this commandment before the Lord um, our God. So part of the question as you're reading through the story of scripture, when you come to this point in Deuteronomy, which is the second giving of the law, the reminding of the people what had been given at the front end of the wilderness wanderings before they go into the land. It's sort of like a long exposition by Moses giving final words of instruction and encouragement before the people go into the land. So the question is, who are these people and what has God already done for them? And on the basis of what? Did he do it? Well, God has delivered them by, their, by his grace from Egypt to this new land. And he wants them to walk in a way that identifies them as belonging to him. The keeping of the law is a reflection of who they are and who their God is. It's not a keeping of the law to gain the favor of God, but it's having received the favor of God who brought them out of the land of Egypt. Redemption precedes the giving of the law. The, it's not the giving of the law, and if you keep it, then I'll make you my people. And sometimes we get this uh, backwards, if not theologically, a lot of times experientially. 
And so one of the questions I want to raise and have us sort of think through our time together this morning is, does the way we parent and grandparent um, in ways that we aren't ever intending reflecting to our children in the way we expect certain kinds of behavior from them, whether they're little ones or teenagers or even now, ways that Beth and I struggle with how we wish our children would conform more to the way we think they should do parenting, which is another conversation later. Um, are we subtly, subtly saying that um, we, you must obey to measure up to receive my favor. And, and that is something I think we really have to work against. Our children shouldn't be growing up and hearing a gospel that says, if I don't perform, I'm not loved. They should be hearing a gospel that says, I'm loved. I, our, our granddaughter Lydia, when she was about four, um, you know, she was being corrected by her parents and she apologized. And then she said to them, but I'm loved no matter what, right? See, Eric and Elizabeth are teaching their children that they're loved no matter what, even though they're not going to get dessert because of this behavior or whatever the case may be. So for a four-year-old to know that the bottom line of this discipline and interacting was, no matter what, you love me. That's, I'm not saying Eric and Elizabeth are doing it perfectly, but... I'm not sure our kids would have said that when they were four growing up in our house. So one of, the, one of the blessings and one of the hopes for our children, our grandchildren, is things that we've struggled with, they'll have a better starting point because of the gospel working generationally um, in the lives of our children. So do you have I any agree. comments on that? <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's theologically we say let's, let's not get the imperative ahead of the indicative. The indicative is what God has already done for us in Christ. And over and over again, what do you do when your child says, why should I obey these rules? That's the question that it poses there in verse uh, 20. Is the answer, because I said so? Or is the answer, um, because if you don't, then I'll withhold my love from you? No, the answer is, God brought us out of Egypt. God set his love on us in ways that we didn't deserve. And he's brought us out and we're about to go into this land filled with all kinds of things that we didn't plant or build or dig. And we're the beneficiaries of God's goodness and grace and he's giving this, these laws for our good that we would be able to uh, remain close to him, reflect him and be uh, people that uh, his love set on us produces the fruit, as we'll see later in Hebrews 12, of godliness and holiness. The peaceful fruit of righteousness, Hebrews 12 says, is a result of his loving discipline. It's not punitive, it's corrective and shaping toward a goal that has to do with God um, and reaction to him. But our, our tendency, of course, our sinful tendency is, is always performance-based isn't it? Um, we sort of can't ever escape that, even though uh, the, the gospel tries, does shape us against that, but we still just always go back to that setting. <laughs> and here again, you're going to see, as we did in 78, uh, Psalm 78, and we'll be seeing again in some of the other passages we'll look at uh, later this morning. Um, it's from the heart. It's about the heart. The behavior is a fruit of the heart. Um, you know, the book by Tripp entitled Shepherding a Child's Heart, you know, is, is a, a key that uh, captures that phrase, and it just keeps recurring over and over again. Well, and shaping the heart, but not squelching it. So we don't want to break their spirit, but we do want to shape their spirit. Yeah, I, I grew up in a household that even though my dad was a pastor um, <clears throat> and as I look at his parents and grandparents before him I understand this a whole lot more now than I did then um, but he was um, he he raised us in a way that 
we, were, we feared him, um, and we felt, my two younger brothers and I felt like if we didn't measure up to what dad wanted, we would incur his wrath, and the wrath was not coming from a place of love. So we were afraid of him, <clears throat> and we, you know, I worked really, really hard to please my dad in every way, whether it was sports or academics or all kinds of things, um, and had, by, you know, had pretty good success. So I weathered his wrath by performing, but always lived that with this sense of, I don't ever think it's enough, okay? My brother Jeff, uh, partly living in my shadow and my dad thinking Jeff should be exactly like me and perform exactly like me and all the same sports and all the same interests, um, didn't measure up. And so Jeff just shut down and took my dad's shaming of him. Um, and my brother Tim just tried as the youngest one to avoid. So I performed, Jeff shut down, and Tim avoided. Because it was never good enough for dad to feel secure in the family. Now, when I look at what he grew up with, and I look at sort of, and then I look at his life over the years. He died at age 53, 40 years ago. Um, <clears throat> just a couple weeks ago. I, I began to see that by the grace of God, my dad was overcoming some of, some of those generational sins. Um, and that um, he was making progress. I, I've learned over time um, to, all these years after he's died, I've learned to give him more room to be who we, uh, he was and see, it's sort of like, C.S. Lewis talks somewhere about how, you know, it's not, God looks at, when we look at sanctification, it's we've moved from here to here, um, which may be way more than what I've done in my life, who, that, that from some objective measure may be way more than somebody who's only moved from here to here. So I'm thankful for the ways that God um, is allowing, even after my dad's death, and this is an issue for I'm sure many of you out there too, is how do, you, how do you process? You go back into your genogram and you see things that happened and ways that you were sinned against and, and uh, other sin patterns in your family life and the people are no longer living and you can't go and make things right. But I think it's important in our own hearts, we, even though we're not able to talk with the people, to, you know, I, I've come to love and appreciate my dad more in, as I've gotten older than I did when I was younger and recognize some of those things and then turn toward my children. And there's some things we didn't do well with our children that we're having some opportunity with our grandchildren to do now because of the way that the gospel continues to work in our own lives. And we are, you know, so rather than being paralyzed and handicapped, you know, the healing power of the gospel to overcome some of those generational patterns um, enables us to find freedom and healing ourselves and then be an instrument of that uh, with other people. So. My experience in my home was pretty much the opposite. Um, my parents were very gracious and, and um, my dad, I'll just compare dads, um, my dad was, well somebody once said to me, your dad is just like Jesus. <laughs> and I'm like, well, he kind of was because he was, he was really a nice guy and he was uh, just a very kind-hearted, um, grace-oriented person. And, and the problem in our family was my dad was so nice that he just he had trouble with boundaries when it came to people in the church because he was really a pastor. He really, really was. So my dad, that was what he, he did. He was so gifted at, at that. So I had to reconcile... How do you push Jesus off the pedestal when <laughs> Jesus is your dad? So anyway, um, I learned how to do that when I was going through the counseling and counseling program and stuff. But um, so we were we were quite a blend our mm -hmm. experience growing up. So uh, yes, we have not done it perfectly. <laughs> um, you see here again in this passage the 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 multi generational view. Um, they're called to serve God as long as they live. 
uh, it's, it's the pattern is sort of like this. If you think of it for Israel, you think of it for us, think of it for the church. He loved us. And because he loved us first, we are enabled to love him back. And we express that love by following his ways. If you love me, keep my commandments, Jesus said. Not as a burden, but as a blessing for our good as a way of expressing um, love to God. Um, so you see here how much God provided for them, but then he also gives some very practical instruction in verses 7 to 9, and we'll just go through this a little bit and then take some time for some questions and comments. Um, I read it earlier, you shall teach that these words, shall, they shall be on your heart. Verse 7, you shall teach them diligently to your children, shall talk of them when you sit in your house, when you walk by the way, when you lie down, when you rise, you shall bind them as a sign in your hand, and so on. It's like everywhere, all the time, with everybody in your family, you're reminding them of who God is and how it's a blessing to do life God's way. Okay? And um, so we've, we've put a few suggestions together here. You want to start um, through that, Beth, and I'll sure. pop in every once in a while? Yeah. Instructing our children really comes through the everyday experiences. Uh, just, uh, you know, not so much the formal things, but the informal things. And as you're living out each day, uh, modeling um, uh, when you have sinned in the presence of your children or sinned against them, modeling uh, forgiveness and asking for forgiveness and recognizing that you had done something that uh, sinned against either your children or somebody else or something. Um, and, and so that would be a wonderful way to help your children grow um, as believers. Uh, anyway, to, to learn how to model that for them. I think that is so important and we live, so many of us were raised in a, a home that didn't do that, where, where our parents said, you know, you do it because I'm your dad and that's it. No questions, no talking about it. And um, so to try not to do it that way, because I don't think that's very healthy. Anyway, um, telling Bible stories before bedtime um, is a wonderful opportunity too. And praying with them. I cannot stress the importance of prayer in a relationship with your children to, to instruct them. When I was a child, my parents were both praying people. So this is something that they modeled from the time I, before I was born. But um, we had a woman come to our church that had written a book on prayer, and she spoke to, um, in the, you know, for a weekend conference about prayer. And, and so I remember instructing this person and my dad, teaching the congregation how to pray. And, and that just makes such a difference in our lives and in our children's lives. So prayer is foundational. And um, maybe reenacting the Christmas story in, in, in silly ways even, respectful, but, but enough that it's childlike so that you don't have to make it be a, a perfect thing. Um, or maybe when you're riding in the car. When I was a child, um, we often, we didn't even have a radio in our car. Um, so we didn't even have carpeting in our car. So this was, I'm, I'm that old. The dashboard was metal that you hit just, your head yeah. on, you'd probably die. You and know, so no we would ride belts. along. We would, we would be riding along to our grandparents or, or on a trip somewhere. And my parents loved to sing. And so they, my dad was a tenor and my mom was an alto. And so they started songs. They taught us songs and then they taught us all of the parts. And so we children, there were four of us, we all took a different part. And so we just would sing. And then one time I took a trip with our kids back a nine hour drive with three kids without Mark. And so I decided to implement that strategy and I taught them how to sing. And um, music has been a very big part in our lives and in their lives, mm -hmm. uh, especially. Um, or maybe um, just reminding them if you're, if you're cooking, following a recipe that God is a God of order. And, um, or when you're putting food on the plate, the, pointing out the various colors, you know, how God is so much the artist, so much the creator that he created a beautiful array for us to enjoy. And so to have your children point that out to them so that they can see this. Um, and so um, the sights and smells and textures of, of food and, and of God's creation. Um, we did a lot of camping growing up. And when our children were little, we camped because we couldn't afford hotels. And so... Um, and many people would look down on that, perhaps say, ooh, you camp. But you know what? 
I wouldn't trade that for anything. And mm -hmm. to teach our children how to love nature and how to enjoy the weather, whether it's a rainy, stormy night uh, or whether it's a beautiful, sunny day, and just to be in God's creation. Yeah. That's a marvelous way to do that. We went camping with our Cousins. youngest son oh. just last weekend. Yeah, uh, we did. It, we hadn't been camping for about 15 years, so it was, we were a little rusty. But uh, In our tent. Yeah, so we were in a tent, you know, and all that sort of thing with, with Eric and Elizabeth and their five-year-old and three-year-old girls. And they couldn't wait for the s'mores, of course, in the evening. And then at breakfast, I think it was my wife had the idea of how about s'mores for breakfast. And so the grand, granddaughters called them uh, s'mornings. S'mornings. <laughs> yeah, right, that's a good right. way to remember. So, um, so yeah. aside from flea bites and mosquito yeah, bites, right. we had a wonderful time. So, um, but anyway, and also in relationships, one of our professors, Jerem Bars, um, his, his mother, uh, his father had died, his mother remarried, and the man she married was not a believer and was a sort of an awful man. Um, and so Jerem was trying to figure out a way to get to know him, to have any kind of a relationship. And so his main point is just build a bridge. You don't have to share the entire gospel with somebody. Just build a bridge and begin that relationship with them. So I'm saying teach your children how to have relationships with people. And it doesn't have to be perfect and it doesn't have to be A to Z, share the gospel. Right. Start with the relationship. Yeah. And, and so that's yeah. crucial. And, and help them see um, other people who aren't believers are made in the image of God. And there are good things that can be uh, learned from and pointed out to them. I remember when, and they will encounter people who are very different from them and helping them to embrace people who are different from them. I remember our daughter Kristen, when she was about three, we had an African-American uh, waitress um, and, and she was, she just kept looking at him. Uh, it was a waiter actually, looking at him and then looking at us and then looking at him and then looking at us and she said, Mommy, we like black people, don't we? It was like she was, this is somebody, she hadn't seen very many black people at that point. And so it was a affirming of this person made in the image of God out of, out of I'm glad she didn't say we don't like black people. I mean, it was, a, it was she's learning things in, about how we treat people in how she should then treat people and understand things. And they, it's amazing what little ones can grasp and understand. Um, Beth had um, a migraine headache or uh, something when we, I went to, to, we were gonna have the COVID, you know, front yard pizza uh, distanced when we weren't uh, being close uh, at that particular time with our children and grandchildren for various reasons. And so they said, where's Grammy, where's Grammy? And I said, she's not feeling well. And, and we're out in the front yard and there are people walking by and Lydia just, she, she didn't say, can we pray for Grammy? She just started praying for Grammy out loud. And then at the end, she started singing in a loud voice, you know, the song, our God is so big, so strong and so mighty. He's going to heal Grammy and she's going to be fine. And next time when she sees Grammy, she says, um, are you feeling better, Grammy? I mean, it, it's, yeah. it's amazing how our children and grandchildren can actually minister to us. And this is part of that, you know, that's, that's her family background coming through to Eric. And then you, you, that's a blessing that goes to a thousand generations. And those are windows of opportunity that the child initiates, actually. And so just to build and establish that with them. And then getting back to the point of prayer, uh, just an example. Um, when I was growing up, uh, I was in high school. We had a dog, an Airedale Terrier and her name was Chris. And so our family was camping and another family that lived out in the country was watching Chris. And um, at that time, Chris the dog had run out, it was a dirt road, but she ran out and got hit by a, a, a car and broke her two front legs. And it's like, oh. Um, so we had to kind of end vacation and go home early and took her to the vet. The dog had surgery because she was the beloved pet. and. Um, the, the, the crucial thing was she was lying out in the garage with both uh, her paws, front paws bandaged, and she couldn't get up. But the thing that had to happen was, and if I can say this, she had to pee. If she didn't urinate, um, then we would have to put her down. And so we as a family went in the house and we all started praying for her. 
And we did. We just all went around and prayed for her. And then I said, I'm going out in the garage and checking on her. And I went out, and there was this great big flood of <laughs> pee <laughs> going down to the drain at the base of the garage floor. And um, anyway, God answers prayer. He cares about little details, even funny ones like yeah. that. Um, so I just wanted to point that out. <laughs> Speaking of dogs, one of the thing that, things that um, I did with, uh, with, with Stephen when he was 14, uh, we were pastoring in Richmond at the time in Indiana. And, um, you know, Stephen had made public profession of his faith, uh, been admitted to the Lord's Supper. Um, and I was thinking through, you know, sort of this, our children, while I never, I said to Stephen, um, you've, you've made a profession of faith, you're 14 years old, um, our relationship is beginning to change. Um, I'm, I'll still be your father, but increasingly our relationship will be more like an older brother, younger brother. Okay? And that's a dynamic that happens along the way. Now, 14 is a little bit young to maybe be saying that. And I said to him, and this is when I'm beginning to sense some things in my own life that needed to be faced and dealt with. And so <clears throat> I had learned from a guy uh, who said, we need to have the kind of relationship with people in the body of Christ, at least a handful of people that we can say to them, like I could say to Sean, if you see anything in my life that's contradictory to what's in God's word, I'm giving you permission in advance to tell me about that. Now, People don't usually do that. We have to figure out how are we going to break in to tell Mark the things we need to tell him. But if I give you permission in advance. So I decided to do that with Stephen. I said, Stephen, you, s you have a window into the pastor of Christ Presbyterian Church that most of the elders don't even have. You live with me every day. You see my faults and my sins. I said, so I'm, I'm asking you, when you see something in my life that's inconsistent with, the, with what God says in his word, to tell me about it. I'm giving you permission. I said, now, let me tell you about the verse that says, love covers a multitude of sins, okay? So not some little picky thing where I now have permission to tell dad how bad he is, but if you see something that you think is significant enough or repeated enough, then come tell me. So um, a few weeks later, uh, he comes up to me and he says, dad, I don't know if this is a good time or not, but I'd like to tell you something. I said, okay. He said, um, I think that the way you express your frustration and anger about certain things in your life that don't have anything to do with the dog, that you shouldn't take your anger out on the dog. <laughs> and the first thing that rose up in with me, inside of me was, who do you think you are telling your dad how he's supposed to behave? And partway through that thought process, I remembered I'd given him permission to do that. And he did it so well, you know, it might not be the right time and, you know, whatever. And, and, you know, that was a significant point where, you know, part of the way God used that was it kept, you go into those teen years, those later teen years, how do you keep having conversation of speaking into your child's life when they often don't want you to? And, and I'm not suggesting this as a, you know, sort of a manipulative tool, but part of the fact that I had done that, kept conversations about difficult things open longer than it might have otherwise. And that was simply saying, I need the gospel as much as you, and will you help me to grow as I try to help you to grow? And I think that's, a, that's an important dynamic. Okay, let's uh, open up for some questions now. We're at uh, a little before 10, take at least, uh, yeah, we've got a mic here, so comments? Questions, push back, we'll take that too. See, I'll hold my Bible, and if you so heard something in what I talked that said, that, that we said that's not in here, then you can tell. Notice I didn't do that. <laughs> <laughs> Correct. Hi, thank Hi. you again yeah, uh, sure. for being here. My name is Scovia Rushing, and this is my husband, Brandon Rushing. Um, and my question is I come from a different culture, I'm Sudanese, and I grew up. Um, with my grandparents because my dad died in the war and my mm. mom uh, kind of did the best that she could to provide for my family and I and I hadn't seen her for 11 years so I really didn't have a mom or a dad mm. and my grandparents were my parents 
and coming to the States and meeting my husband. He has a loving family, but he comes from a family of divorce. And so we are thinking of having kids, prayerfully, uh, if the Lord wills. What do you all think about us parenting our uh, future kids, if the Lord wills, um, from me coming from a broken home with no mom or dad with me, but him having mom and dad, but uh, him having um, a dad, yeah. a stepmom, and a mother, yeah, right. you know, that parented him. Yeah. So that's my question. Yeah. Thanks. Yeah, I guess my first response in general would be that <coughs> you have some challenges that most people in this room don't necessarily have, but you also, your children will have some opportunities that the children of most of us in here will not have in terms of um, understanding um, cultural dynamics, understanding um, the, the way sin impacts families in terms of divorce. And so there's a, and even in, in you said the loss of your dad when you were young in the war and that sort of thing. So there's, there's loss and grief that is very real that they will at the right age appropriate time that they, as they learn their family story it's like you don't do genograms with three-year-olds of course but three-year-olds experience what's in genograms okay so part of it is you you have opportunity to to um, raise and nurture your children you, you have your it's a fresh starting point when a new child is born and so you have opportunity to pour in positive ways into them out of the fruit of how God has worked through the gospel in your own lives and with all of the, the things you hold in common with other believing parents, but with the stewarding of the unique things that you have uh, to bring to bear in that as well. So, And you? I would say, too, um, if you, uh, under your circumstances, um, if you surround yourself with others, who, have, who are maybe a step ahead in parenting, like in a small group, um, and have them uh, help you, uh, you know, so that, and, and there are plenty of books out there on parenting, good ones and bad ones, so make sure you get the good ones, and I know there's a book table or something that has some things. But anyway, um, but surround yourself with people who, that you can trust, safe people who aren't going to try to squelch you um, but they can help you. And there are so many people that have gone through divorce that are married and raising children. And there are people that have had tragedy upon tragedy in their lives. And yet God blesses them with children. And we have a, there's a professor that, I guess he's still alive, Henry Crabendom. And he, his little phrase was he had done a, a, a conference at our church one weekend in Cincinnati. And one of the takeaways I got was, his phrase was, children are little vipers in covenantal diapers. <laughs> so they're not going to be this perfect thing. That com you know, they're going to be these little sinners um, that, that are going to kind of look like you guys. But, um, but So you're going to have to educate yourself as much as you can. And there's going to be a lot of, there, you'll make tons of mistakes. Um, but the, again, the, thing, the important things are forgiveness, prayer. You implement those things, and God's grace never, ever forget that his Holy Spirit is with you, and his grace is upon you, and he will get you through. And it's not going to be perfect, because you guys aren't perfect, and neither are we. But, but just that is what I would say, as I did say it. There are a few grandparents here. <laughs> you, you all are grandparents. What kinds of conversations have you had with your children with respect to, to your role as grandparents? Mm -hmm. you, you know, how have you navigated those particular waters? Uh, are those waters that need to be navigated? No. It's, 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 <laughs> We're going to get to that in the next, in the next yeah. session. Well, but the moment's now. So but the moment's now, now, too. So, yeah. Yeah, it's... Uh, <clears throat> let me tell a, a bit of a story. Um, when we were at Church of the Covenant in Cincinnati, Ohio, we were involved in helping start a parent-run Christian school there. And um, it was made up initially of mostly homeschooling families. 
who were homeschooling by default. They weren't comfortable with the public schools and they felt like a lot of the Christian schools were so sort of fundamentalist that it was and legalistic that they, they decided to homeschool. So when we started the school, um, <clears throat> most of the parents wanted to be more involved in the classroom uh, than they should have in terms of the teacher being able to teach the children. So this whole phrase of in loco parentis, the, the Latin phrase about you have the parental authority in that location. So I had to do some teaching about that. I was chairman of the board um, where basically when your children walk out of your front door and walk into a classroom door, the person that you are giving parental authority to, even though you have that, is to the teacher in the classroom. Even if you're an aide in the classroom, the teacher has more parental authority with your child in that location for that time than you do. Okay? So, just sort of step back from that now. And <clears throat> as grandparents, sometimes we are in a position where we are watching children and we have been given parental authority as we watch them. We don't have parental authority with those children as grandparents. The parents do. So I think the conversations have to do with, I mean, it, th this would be uh, an inappropriate understanding of grandparenting to say, um, when I'm around your kids, I, I, let me just say one other thing. And when I have that parental authority, I need to have the instruction from the parents about how I should exercise that authority when it comes to discipline or different kinds of things like that. So I think it's, it's a challenge because and, and if you haven't, if our children and we have not matured to the point where we have let them go, they have left father and mother and joined to their spouse, the two become one flesh, and children are a fruit of that. There's something about that leaving that if it hasn't happened, and I don't just mean physically, but also emotionally, then you're going to have problems. So part of preparing the way for <clears throat> um, our children's children, if you're not grandparents yet, is building toward the time. The goal is to send the children out from our home to establish their own. And then we trust how God works. So we're, we're advisors when asked with our children in relationship to how they're parenting. I'm sure most grandparents like Beth and I have lots of conversations about how we wish our children were doing some things differently. Because if we were parenting those children, we would do such and such, okay? Um, I remember one time, and it was it was a bit of sinful frustration and anger with my granddaughter who was about five at the time when she was just uncontrollably wouldn't do anything no matter what I said and I just sort of instinctively swatted her bottom and she turned and looked at me and they have a different view of spanking than we do <clears throat> and she turned and looked at me like what was that and why did you do that now her behavior got really good right after that you know that's that's part of the problem with if we spank just to get get it to go well for us. We ourselves. always called it clearing yeah. the air. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that'll be a, a later discussion. But I think we just have to navigate that very carefully and keep reminding ourselves we pray for them, we encourage them. There are times where we've had conversations where we've, we've raised a question, but it hasn't come from a place of authority over their children. It's more, more like that. It's almost in reverse with Stephen you know, saying you can speak into my life if you see something, it's speaking into his life, but it's not um, being, it's, us it's not usurping his authority. And that's hard, especially when what you have are, when our children get married, they bring other backgrounds and experiences into parenting. Um, and then they have to figure out, just like we did who have parents, what are we gonna do that was like your family? What, what are we gonna, where they don't overlap, are we gonna choose one or the other or a third way? And so they're having to decide that about us and the other parents. Um, well, yes, also I think thinking about, well, how would you want to be grand, 
if you had grandparents, how would, I mean, your parents, how do you want them interacting with you and your children? Do you want them to be meddlesome and, um, you know, a, that kind of a, a input? Or no, I, I mean, I don't. So I, I have to remind myself, I do not want to be that grandparent. So it's better to kind of step back, I think. This is um, what and pray for them rather than to be meddlesome and really uh, that, that causes division too. If you want to have a relationship with your, with your kids and your grandchildren, uh, everything in moderation, I think. Well, and you have to be willing to accept <coughs> that they have chosen to do some things differently than you would if you were in their situation. But if there's harm being yeah. done, yeah. if it's a dangerous situation to your grandchild, that's a completely different situation. This is just, you know, it's better to be uh, moderate um, in a normal uh, relationship. But if it's a dangerous thing where there's drugs or alcohol or sexual abuse or um, guns, anything like that, then you have to speak on behalf of that child. This is, a, this is a major question that's come up in our class at the seminary from these families that don't come from Christian backgrounds, whose parents have in essence, can't understand why they're going to seminary and going into ministry and this whole Christian thing doesn't make any sense and so on and so forth. And, you know, they, some of them are not comfortable leaving their children with their parents uh, without them present. And that's a very real challenge. Um, but I think, you know, a lot of it, a lot of it has to do with what kind of relationship we have with our children as adults and how we're nurturing that and how we're navigating that. And if there's work that needs to be done there, um, I think we need to, I mean, uh, our family, we may tell a little bit later, but we, our family, uh, there were some things that happened that just sort of like, we had to go to ground zero and sort of rebuild trust within our relationships because of intrusion of another um, extended family member. But, um, I think conversations, um, a lot of it just has to do with how, what your relationship with your adult children is and how, how much you can talk about some of the things that are there, but it's... Um, and how much freedom they yeah. give you I mean, I, I, to enter. One of our children has a uh, mother-in-law, one of our, um, yeah, and, um, you know, there's this whenever they come to visit, uh, this child of ours is like um, just almost a different person overwhelmed with making sure that everything is perfect and matches up to what this mother-in-law wants. And it just, um, you know, so that, that's something that um, has to be, that's a growing area for them and they have to, to work that through and and it's, it's interesting that they feel, at least at this point, um, in relationship with us, free to talk with us about that. Um, and we're able to sort of be reassuring about being free from the burden of that without unnecessarily causing disharm. It's, it's never, a lot of things are just not clean and clear and black and white. They never are. <laughs> to live with the messiness of, of the fallenness of life and family systems. And again, when you understand the background of this mother-in-law, there are some real dynamics that make it more understanding as you, you try to love folks well that don't seem to be loving well um, in that regard. So, other questions? Yeah. I don't be asking all the questions, so. <laughs> it's all right. Sorry if I'm hogging the mic. Um, but. So my question is a two-part. So Mark, you said that while you were growing up with your parents, um, you performed and your brother shut down and your other sibling avoided uh, conflict. And Beth, you were the complete opposite where <laughs> your dad was really nice and all of that. So before you all had kids and were thinking of having kids, what was that relationship like? Um, one, Mark, with your dad and two, Beth, with, with your dad, um, like if you all had conflict, did Mark, did you run to your dad or 
Beth, did you run to your mom, et cetera? Um, so that's my question. How did that uh, affect your marriage and wanting kids? <laughs> I don't remember running to either of our parents about our own dirty laundry. Um, we just sort of duped it out and worked it out. Um, <laughs> Not, not always in good ways. One time I was making uh, meatballs and Mark was telling me about one more commitment that he had and I just threw the raw meatball at him and it splattered all over the yeah. popcorn ceiling and everything. I was on a bench and there was a wall <laughs> behind me and she was at he the ducked. kitchen sink. <laughs> And she, I saw this meatball coming and it went like this, and it splattered against the wall. So that's an example of how we yes. worked it out between us. We didn't, we didn't go running to yes. our parents, but um, I, was, I was afraid of Mark's dad, although I knew Mark's dad because I was a college student, um, and he was, um, he, vice president. Mm -hmm. yes, he was a vice president at the college that, that we both attended. That's where we met. So I knew his dad, and I had a good relationship with him, but I was also intimidated so, but he was very wise too, so I would go to him for counsel, but not about Mark. Mm -hmm. And um, yeah. we didn't take those yeah, things. Yeah, I think, you know, and, and you all have gone through this as well, probably with your parents, but it was, I remember the first time I decided that we would make a decision about purchasing a car <laughs> without asking my dad what he thought about it. Now, my dad might have had some really good advice that I needed, but I needed, that was part of, you know, three years into marriage, still leaving father and mother, okay? And I remember when I, I, I said, uh, Dad, we bought a new car. And he said, what'd you do with your old one? I said, well, we traded in. He said, well, why didn't you talk to me? One of your brothers might have wanted to buy your other car. I said, well, we decided we need to just make this decision without talking to you first. That was such a major step for me, but a very important step in our marriage and hopefully an important step in the way we then would raise our future kids as they would leave father and mother and that sort of thing as well. So, And we would take things, um, we would talk things over with my parents and pr they would pray with us. So mm -hmm. we, we felt freedom to do that. Um, in well, general. it also gave me freedom then to talk to my dad and seek his wise counsel right. without it being sort of this power relationship intimidation. Um, I'm not being a, a good person if I don't talk with my dad in advance. And we all have, th th this may seem like a strange little thing, but the, what's behind that, what's underneath that, and the transforming, I mean, I was, I was fearful of calling him and telling him I had done that, okay? Um, and I'm like, okay, so what? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so, yeah, it's messy, and I think that's the other thing is, if it's if the goal is um, being a like I was saying for us, our sin pattern was being a pastor's family that has it all together. Um, what you begin to do is define more and more narrowly what having it all together means. And it's basically those things that you don't appear to have much of a struggle with. You know, all those bad, terrible sins that we don't struggle with. So we have it all together because of that when you realize in ministry, I'm functioning in a way I'm trying to be, to be God for people in their lives. Um, that was a big um, breakthrough in, in my life after we had a, a, a transformative experience with uh, Jack Miller and uh, the last Sonship Week that he did before he died. And I remember coming, we, we thought uh, we just weren't willing to face um, the depth of our own patterns of sin and asking God to show us our sin. This is an important prayer parents should pray. I went many years without ever saying, Lord, will you please show me my sin and the sin patterns in my life. Now, when I would sin, I'd be sort of quick to acknowledge it and ask forgiveness. But do we pray and ask God to really show us the deep sin patterns in our lives? Only if we believe the power of the gospel is sufficient to go however deep our sin goes. And um, I remember, you know, I, I come, coming back to Christ Pres and preaching after that and, and talking about um, <clears throat> how God had shown me sin patterns in my life. And they weren't in the second table of the law, they were in the first table of the law. 
I was trying to be God. Um, and that little round table in the corner of the office there with the two windows on each side, I always used to sit in one place and whoever I was counseling was at the other one and I made it intentional point to sit in a different place that I'd quit being the one trying to be God and I would just be the pastor trying to facilitate what God wanted to do. And I remember when the, and, and I was basically saying, I think my sins in the first half of the law are worse than the ones in the second half of the law and your pastor is, is a sinner and I need to grow and, and you, I need you to help me. And one of the guys met me at the door and he said, Mark, I'm just really, I did not like that sermon. I said, why? He said, I was hoping that there was at least somebody who did have it all together and I thought that was you. <laughs> I said, sorry, only Jesus does. I mean, that was, but, and it made an, an impact in our, in our, uh, in the way we related to our children. Some of that stuff related to Stephen and opening the Bible and um, it was, you know, it set us on a course and ended up at Covenant Seminary. I mean, just our lives in every dimension and I'd say especially parenting were transformed because we were willing to say we have as much or more sin than our children do and we need the gospel even more than they do. And that freed us up and made us better parents in relationship to our kids. And we get so. to say it to our grandchildren as yeah. well. <laughs> All right, we're at 1020. Why don't we take about a 10 minute break? And I, and I know there isn't like coffee and donuts and all that good stuff. So go eat some imaginary donuts and, uh, you know, imagine the smell of coffee and whatever. <laughs> we're glad you're here. And uh, we're glad to put our masks on and have a little closer conversations if you want to do that too. Um, so we'll come back about 10, 1030.
I don't have... Oh. I think we'll get started back up. How about that? Whoa. Woo. Oh, yeah, I can take my mask off. That helps. Okay, good. Wow, this class really got quiet quickly. Doesn't always happen at the seminary. Um, because they're just so excited to talk about all the good things we're teaching them, right? Um, I think I, I want to revisit Mike's uh, question a little bit. Um, I think what we, when our children get married, uh, they bring a whole new family system into the one yeah. that we're used to having with them. And um, a lot of times they, as most of us, you know, we're, you know, there's always things that you, if you pursue it, you will discover things in your family system that weren't the way you thought they were. And, and until you have that work of discovery, you just bring those patterns in without any self-reflection on, this is just the way things normally are. You know, from the silliest, you know, which way do you squeeze the toothpaste, you know? Well, that's the right way. Well, no, this is the right way. Or whether the toilet paper comes from the top or underneath. And we always did underneath and Beth always did on top. And finally I realized it actually makes more sense to do it from the top. There's less that ends on the floor like the grandchildren always like to do with the toilet paper, you know? But on more serious matters, um, you know, we have a daughter-in-law who grew up in a family where her mom got MS at when, she, when Katrina was 10, and she had three younger siblings, and the dad didn't do a very good job of actually caring for the mother. And so Katrina had a lot of, her, her dad was somewhat absent, her mother was incapacitated, and she, there was a lot of nurturing between 10 and when she married Stephen. That, happened because she was at Westminster Christian Academy, she was an RUF at University of Missouri, there were a lot of people that came around her, but there were some fundamental core things in family of origin that got carried into the marriage. Um, Kristen married a man whose dad had been an alcoholic, um, and you know, there's a real story of redemption there. He came to Christ and the family you know, had a lot of of healing, but there's still a lot of deep-rooted patterns there in that family of origin that, again, if you don't process some of that and get aware of that, it comes in and it bomb. I remember Beth and I having a conversation one time. Why did our children have to, why did God design our children to marry people who didn't necessarily come from believing families and had all this stuff in them? And then I remember just having this insight well, two reasons. One, some of the healthy things in our family is able to minister to them, and them coming in the family exposed some unhealthy things in ours that we had to face because they came into the family. And um, that's part of what I was referencing earlier, where um, when our daughter wanted to marry, Kristen wanted to marry John, we had... Um, a sibling of, of Beth's who just met John and like 10 minutes later decided um, he was not good for Kristen. And basically, long story that lasted many years, you know, it's like we end up having to, it, it brought a lot of family of origin things up from Beth growing up um, <clears throat> with this particular sister and basically we were left with, do we, we had to make a choice of whether or not to support our daughter or, n or if we did, didn't, it sort of maintain the status quo with this relationship or, uh, you know, support our daughter and have it be disrupted. We went many years before we began to get healing in that. It was and, eight years of estrangement. Yeah. Pretty much. And um, that wasn't easy. But, but what it did is it, 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 it took us, it was, it opened, you know, I, I was saying to Jeremy a minute ago, you bring these unknown things into a marriage and the capacity to get healing for them if you don't own that they even exist. You know, God can't work if they, they aren't there, but how does God bring healing? He exposes them mm -hmm. and brings them into the light of the gospel so they can get healing. 
and I think that, uh, you know, that's, we, we can be of, we can be of help with our children as they get married and then eventually have grandchildren um, by being open to ways that these new family systems that intersect with ours, there's both opportunity to minister to and opportunity to say, Lord, show us with this new, much more complicated family system with three other families with our three children, what you want to do in us with the things that are surfacing in that. And if that's happening, then you can work out the grandchildren things better, it seems to me. Well, and one, one example too of, of in, in a grandparenting situation that happened, um, our, our, our daughter's um, fourth child, fifth child, <laughs> sorry, <laughs> the fifth child when she was born, um, she was just maybe three weeks old, and um, Kristen was nursing her, and I happened to be out there. They lived in California, and I was out there, and um, something terribly wrong happened with the baby. She just um, started, just quit breathing, basically, so we had to call 911, and all of the other kids had been put to bed. It was evening, and um, the ambulance came, but the nine-year-old, the oldest granddaughter at the time, was awake, and so thank God I was there because Kristen and John had to go rush to the hospital in the ambulance with this dying baby. The baby has lived and she's five now, but um, it was a, a terrible situation. But what I was able to do, it was a God-ordained opportunity, was I was able to put my arms around this nine-year-old granddaughter. All the other kids were unaware that anything was going on, thank God. But um, I was able to pray with her and teach her to look to the Lord because we could not do anything about it, but we could pray. Right. And so that was something that has just bonded us. Um, and it was a very difficult circumstance yeah. that no one planned for, but God yeah. allowed it to happen. And you and couldn't ask John and Kristen, how do, you want us, how do you want me to handle this with Natalie? You know, it's like, right. you just right. do it. So anyway, that was yeah. a grandparent yeah. story. We had... Uh, Eric and Elizabeth were in a coronavirus pod, I mean, because of coronavirus, with her parents uh, at, from, from March till now. And we, we, uh, circumc we, we, it used to be we would have a couple days, um, about three days a week with one or more of their kids, but their pod was way more restrictive than we were and our son was. So circumstances going into the fall with school, both the school districts for our two sons' kids are all virtual, but one of them is a teacher in the school district and has to be in her classroom, but her girls are home. Our, her husband is in a master's of uh, degree in speech uh, therapy. Our son. <laughs> Our son, sorry. Um, get these generations confused as I get old, but... Um, so he, his internship is in the VA hospital, okay? Um, he has to be there three, maybe four days a week. So his wife's dad has such a negative view of the VA hospital, they're stepping out of the pod and won't be watching the grandchildren. Um, so Steve and our other son is working at home with a health system um, that he has to be sort of, he can't, do anything with the kids and he's at home and Katrina is a paralegal for her dad three days a week and is now back it's supposed to be back in the office so both of our sons need help from the grandparents so we have this discussion about what's a pod look like for us and them well Eric and Elizabeth are more restrictive than Stephen and Katrina they sent their kids to camp this summer Honey Rock up in Wisconsin and Stephen played some, some baseball and Preston. Preston, yeah. And so. <laughs> that's uh, my role, is just. <laughs> a, keep the right names going there. Keep yes. it straight. Um, so, how do we get Stephen and Katrina to be willing to be more restrictive and Eric and Elizabeth to allow for some things they're not completely comfortable with? Well, and then you and have the, Stephen and Katrina's kids are 12 and 9 and 5, and Eric's are kids five are and 5 and 3. So. Right. So, 
the dilemma is we can't help both families unless we're all agreed on how we're going to be in this pod together. Submitting to one another. And uh, one of the daughter-in-laws says, well, I don't think there's much to talk about. We can just trust each other. And the other one's saying, yeah, but you sent your kids to camp and let Preston play baseball, and we're not sure we trust. You know, so anyway, so we, this, this week, we had a two-and-a-half-hour Zoom call, the six of us, <laughs> and I outlined in my best way I possibly could, these are all the things I need to talk about. And you talk about all these things, establish the boundaries so you can then have trust and only talk about things that are outside of the boundaries. So it was, you know, Beth and I were sort of faced with, wow, the, these two families get together, pretty, get along pretty well, but will they in this? <laughs> and if they can't agree, which family do we help? Okay. So um, they reached agreement and uh, they... And we left town. <laughs> right. Yeah, to come down here and expose ourselves to Memphis viral <laughs> load. Yeah, that's right. And now we'll have to quarantine. So and we had to say, you know, all, we, our meals had to be adjusted a little bit to be outside because of the pod and all that sort of thing. But, and thank you for accommodating. But, uh, yeah, so it's... Uh, and I think in the midst of, of that, there's some good things have happened. We've been able to address some things with our daughter-in-law that, that impacted the fear that this wouldn't work. And it's, it's, I think it has a potential of carrying us along in some ways that these family systems and some of the things that have been you know, problematic patterns are able to be broken. It doesn't take sin away. It doesn't mean there won't be any problems. Um, but so far we've all checked in on things that are outside of our agreement and I'm thinking, oh no, here's the first test. You know, can Peyton be with two other students in a dance thing in a indoor with masks? And I'm thinking, you know, Eric and Elizabeth are going to say once no. Once a week. Yeah, once a, once a week. And they said, okay. We think that's okay. I'm thinking, this is great. Okay, I mean, we're, we're learning to love each other well uh, while wanting to and it's expressing the views and getting them out there and talking them through and that's that's in a covid kind of way in a covid kind of way you gonna write a song on that <laughs> that's good. okay let's look at uh ephesians 6 verses 1 to 4 you know one thing i always say if you can't remember where any of the passages are parenting where there is uh information about parenting just remember the number six and deuteronomy and ephesians and you'll you'll find them okay um <clears throat> So, let me read Ephesians 6, 1 to 4. Chil children, obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right. Honor your father and mother, this is the first commandment with a promise, that it may go well with you and that you may live long in the land. Fathers, do not provoke your children to anger, but bring them up in the discipline and instruction of the Lord. Uh, other translations said nurture and admonition of the Lord. Okay, so how do we understand um, Ephesians 6 in its context in the book of Ephesians? Well, it's the second of three uh, relationships, husbands and wives, parents and children, masters and slaves, that Paul is addressing, all of which have mutual responsibilities for the husbands and the wives, for the parents and the children, and for the masters and the slaves. And so, <clears throat> to look and see what these mutual responsibilities are between parents and children. Um, children are to obey and honor their parents. Parents are to not exasperate their children, but nurture them. Now, we have this thing that uh, Dr. Chapel named years and years ago around preaching called the fallen condition focus. What's the fallen condition focus of this passage? What is it pointing out as our tendency to sin that this passage is seeping, seeking to help us see we need to look to the Lord and not fall into that kind of sin? Okay. Well, for the children, their fallen con condition focus is they don't want to honor and obey their parents. So they need the gospel in order to want to and to be able to. All right. 
parents um, do exasperate their children and don't nurture them at times. So we need the gospel to be sensitized to where we may be exasperating our children and what we need to do to nurture them more. Now the design, by God's design, in an ideal perfect world without sin, which we don't live in, would be that parents would, the mutuality of this would work perfectly. We would never exasperate our children, we would nurture them well, and they would love to obey us um, and do everything we tell them, okay? So what happens in these, in these relationships where there is someone that has a uh, positional authority, okay, which is husbands, parents, masters, but Paul is not saying to wives, children, and slaves, um, you know, you, you just do it because they tell you to. All right? So how do we enter into this? Well, I think when we look at Ephesians 6, we also have to go back and look at Ephesians 5. Because what I say when I'm doing premarital counseling there's not a whole lot written in the Bible that's just specific to husbands and wives. But there's a whole lot that's written in the Bible about how we live as the people of God in the body of Christ, general admonitions that must especially be true in marriage. So, you know, walking in love and uh, being careful how we walk and um, speaking words that are edifying and not tearing down. That's not in the husband and wife part, but that is back there in Ephesians 4 and 5. Okay, so the general admonitions about how the people of God are to function um, apply to these specific relationships um, as well. So I think, you know, we, we have to um, understand what it means to nurture by other places in the Scripture that talk about that. We have to understand why we obey um, from other places in the Scripture as well. Paul is assuming that, that some of these words that he's using that are specifically applied to husbands and wives and parents and children um, are going to be um, filled in with information um, from other places. So, and don't hear what I'm not saying, to quote Dr. Collins, um, I'm, uh, I'm not saying that the specific assignments of role is leveled and goes away. But I'm saying let's be attentive to even in the parent-child interactions, the responsibilities are not all on the children. They're also responsibilities on the parents. And uh, if the parents do what they're called to do and the children do what they're called to do, it's going to go well. Okay? If one or the other doesn't, it's not going to go so well. Okay? Um, this, uh, let's see now, I'm losing track of my pages, which is where Beth jumps in and says something, right? It Place the discipline, here we go, okay. All right, oh, not there. It must be there. Okay, there we go. It's there. Okay, so the passage doesn't say that it is the parent's job to make sure the children are honoring and obeying. What is a parent supposed to do? Insist they obey me. What's the wife supposed to do? Insist that you love me like Christ loved the church. I mean, it's the first thing we look at is not what the person that's in the other part of the reciprocal relationship is. We look at what we're called to do first. Now, in the parent, that doesn't mean that the parents don't ever, I mean, we're called to instruct and nurture them. So we have to help them understand their role. But we help them understand their role from a posture of understanding our role. I think that's vital. Um, and I think we also need to recognize that exasperating our children will not look the same for every child in every family. Okay, there are things that, that um, it, it, in parenting, there's a lot of child-specific dynamics that are different from other children. And then there are families that do things somewhat differently than other families. And I think in the body of Christ, we have to give each other room for that. Um, or parenting differences can overflow and cause big church fights sometimes, okay? Um, 
But there are a lot of different styles of parenting, and I'm going to let Beth um, uh, speak to that a little bit. And before, well. before I do that, I just want to say, as grandparents, there was a couple in our Cincinnati church, and um, they were from Hendersonville, North Carolina. So they, they had a, a, a real beautiful southern drawl. And um, <laughs> anyway, so the husband's name was Barton, and the wife's name was Dot. And they each lived to be like 100. But, but anyway, <laughs> Barton would always commence with, you know, imparting wisdom, and, and Dot would always say, zip it, Barton. <laughs> so anyway, so that's, that's the basic code for grandparents, zip it, you know. Well, that's uh, good, Beth. I yeah. like that, yeah. Zip it, Barton. Zip so, it, Papa. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay. Um, there's this huge theme that is in our lives, and we can't control it, really, and we can't help it, really, and it entered our lives as we were born into this world, but it entered this world in Genesis 3 when um, at the fall of mankind. And that theme is shame. I think shame was ushered in. Anxiety was ushered in. All of these negative things that we continuously battle against, um, that, that we don't know what life would be like without shame, without anxiety, without anger, un, unbridled anger, I guess you could say, because anger is a God-given emotion. Um, but uh, so this is part of the curse that we live under. And one day we will, as citizens of heaven, we will live not under the curse, but under complete freedom with King Jesus. And we will be totally set free from all of these things that hamper us. And I can't imagine what that will be like because I've never experienced it. But we get a glimpse of it through Christ and what he modeled for us. Um, but when it, comes to, um, when it comes to parenting, there are different styles of parenting. And, and so you can check your boxes, as I mentioned, what these styles are. And you, even if you were raised by grandparents, there's a style of, of being raised. So one style is the absentee parent. And that's the parent who is constantly busy or through a divorce is not present any longer or through a death, not present, um, or just distracted, um, busy with work, uh, fill in the blank. Absentee parent means not present, okay? That's one style. There's another style that I'm adding in here, and that is the anxious parent. The, we called them hovercraft parents back at the Christian school. <laughs> The people that can't help themselves and they just have to hover and, and um, but it's not just that picture. Anxiety is something that's very, very real and we all suffer with it actually and it gets manifested in different ways in our lives. But anxiety is a very um, poisonous thing and so it affects and impacts our parenting. It affects and impacts our marital relationship and relationships with other people and, and relationships in the church, in the community, and you can just see the level of anxiety that has risen um, even in this election season, for instance. So um, anxiety, anxious parenting. Now another kind is um, the authoritarian parent where it's a tops down style of parenting. I'm the dad and you will do what I say and um, or you know we are your parents and you don't have a say-so in this. We're making the decisions, and your job is to just be quiet and obey. Um, and so that's a very frightening um, style to grow up under, but I'm sure some of you have grown up under that. Um, and then, um, and I'm exaggerating some of it, but maybe not. And then there's another style, and that is the passive parent. And that is the parent that maybe grew up under the authoritarian style of parenting. But anyway, at any rate, that parent is passive and permissive. And so allows the children to just uh, do anything they want or th the children are um, run the house, basically. And the parents just sort of cower over there in the corner and don't know what to do and bite their fingernails. And um, anyway, so there's a, a passive parent. And it's um, all of these styles... Um, and there's one more that I'm going to mention. But all of those particular styles come as a result of sin, as a result of something that is absent. 
um, where uh, an individual was raised in a certain way and so their pattern of response to that being raised in a certain way is going to be um, you know, anxious or absentee or passive or authoritarian. So those are some of those ways that, that we respond as parents. But the one way that the Bible presents to us is the gospel-centered way, and that is a, a calm, not always calm, but generally speaking, what Christ presents to us is something and what he offers to us is something that is calm and very present to be present with our children, to be able to be spontaneous and to be able to respond to a situation pretty quickly, um, or at least with maturity. Um, and it's, it's a proper way of training our children, seeing that their lives do matter, that their lives are important, and that they will become one day adults, and they will be responsible individuals. Um, and part of a community of, in, in a secular sense, but also part of a Christian community, we hope, um, and part of the eternal community in heaven. Um, and so, and then also a, a God-centered parent is active, actively involved in the life of, of your children. So um, given that, that's the motivation uh, in parenting, to be Christ-like, and that's what the God-centered um, Christ-centered parenting, gospel-centered parenting model is, is like. And on the matter of, rather than authoritarian, and this will get back to sort of the mutual reciprocal relationships, is to exercise the authority that's been delegated to you under the oversight of Christ. So it doesn't mean you remove authority, it's, it's, it's not yours without accountability, you just do whatever you want. I think that's where we um, sometimes um, in some situations stumble. I wanted to read um, from uh, Hebrews 12 also, because the discipline of our children, where do we see some other places in Scripture where it talks about discipline from a parent to children? Well, it's the way God disciplines us as his children, and it's in Hebrews chapter 12. Um, Hebrews 12, verses 5 to 13. And have you forgotten the exhortation that addresses you as sons? My son, do not regard lightly the discipline of the Lord, nor be weary when reproved by him. For the Lord disciplines the one he loves and chastises every son whom he receives. It is for discipline that you have to endure God is treating you as sons. For what son is there whom his father does not discipline? If you're left without discipline, in which all have participated, then you are illegitimate children and not sons. Besides this, we have had earthly fathers who disciplined us and we respected them. Shall we not much more be subject to the father of spirits and live? For they disciplined us for a short time as it seemed best to them, but he disciplines us for our good that we may share his holiness. For the moment, all discipline seems painful rather than pleasant, but later it yields the peaceful fruit of righteousness to those who have been trained by it. Now, I think our discipline in our homes needs to be patterned after the way God disciplines us as his children. And that's the root of how we can uh, and the source of understanding um, how, to, how to go about this. Um, the goal of discipline uh, of our children should be the same goal that God has for us when he disciplines us, and that is that we would become more like Jesus. Okay? The discipline is not so that things will go easier for me as a parent. And, you know, we, we spanked our kids when... when uh, they were in our home. We don't spank them now. Um, <laughs> and, uh, it, you know, there were times that a spanking just finally brought something to an end and there was peace. Um, and I'm not saying that's necessarily all bad, but it usually was a result of I was frustrated with how loud and out of order and difficult this was. I'm just going to go straight to the spanking and break this curse, okay, in the midst of that. Um, I remember my dad doing that on trips. 
he would pull the car over and then get out and we'd all <laughs> get a spanking. <laughs> then the trip would continue, right? And the yes. trip would That's continue right. in peace. So I think that um, we have to say, um, and I, you know, we'll talk about spanking in a minute, we'll get into, into Proverbs, but I think, what do we need to do to help this child uh, correct the child, discipline the mm -hmm. child in a way that um, will contribute toward their becoming more who God wants them to be? Um, I think there are a wide range of things that we can do. And again, there's a lot of child-specific things um, in terms of, you know, timeouts work for some people. People, yeah, little people. Um, timeouts don't work for others. Um, some, for some, the best thing you could give them is time out, okay? Um, for others, you know, it's the withholding of privileges. And, uh, you know, we, we were, when we were in the COVID world and not potted with uh, our son, Eric and Elizabeth and their girls, we, we would have the driveway cafe at the Dalby driveway with the big oak tree that brought shade in the middle of the summer. And we'd keep our distance and have pancakes or waffles and smoothies and all that good stuff. And, you know... Um, Cora and Lydia one time said, um, we, we can't have anything sweet for breakfast. We're not allowed to because we misbehaved last night. So they're announcing to Grammy and Papa that they can't have anything Well, that's because I sweet. had donut holes and they yeah. said, oh, we can't oh, have Oh, the donut holes were there, that's right. So, <laughs> so they, you know, they, that, that works for them, even so much so that they're making sure that we don't, we don't violate what their parents had told them about what they can't have, you know. Um, can't have any dessert or sweet things. Um, so you, you have to know your kids well enough to know what it is they'll respond to, and it changes over time. Um, well, and, and I think, too, you have to know what each, like, what each parent grew up with, too, because in, in the case of a couple of our in-law, son-in-law, daughter-in-law um, situations, um, the environment was, uh, was pretty toxic, and so the, the manner of discipline was, was not good. And so um, therefore th they've come to, um, in our older son's marriage, they decided that spanking was not going to be something they were going to do because of the anger impact um, and getting out of control. So they have chosen lots and lots of time out and lots and lots of consequences. And they have real hard hitting competitive kids. So it, it's not an easy path. Um, but that's what they've chosen, and so we as grandparents also um, are following that with their children. We, yeah. And with I can't remember who this author was, but um, I think it may have been, it may have been Allinger, but it may not have been. Um, and he said, every child has two questions that they live with mm -hmm. constantly. One is, am I loved? And the second one is, can I do whatever I want? And the answer to the first one is yes, and the answer to the second one is no. And then here, therein lies the tension. The way you, is the way you say yes preventing you from being able to say no? Or is the way you say no preventing you to say yes that they're loved? That, that's, that's just in a very simple way, I think, summarizes the tension and the struggle. Um, and yet... God assures us that he loves us and he may give us a long rope, but he's not going to let us get away with things we want to do. And, um, Are you so going to share the story about Stephen, Stephen and Jay? And Jay? Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. Um, so Stephen was a senior in high school, about to graduate from Richmond High School and it was spring break before the senior year. And another, an African-American pastor in town that we were close to and the boys played sports together and all that sort of thing. Uh, the son's name was Jay, and so Stephen said, Jay and I and some others want to go to Florida over spring break. Uh, can we go? And Beth and I weren't comfortable with some of the others who were going. Or, or, or the even age. whether we should <laughs> let them do it, yeah. So he no just, adult supervision. Yeah, he just kept <laughs> pressing, and he kept pressing, and he kept pressing, and we're thinking, golly, what in the world do we do? And we prayed about it, and we talked about it, and we interacted with him, and he was making his case well, as only Stephen can do. And uh, we finally said, um, no, you can't go. And uh, it was one of the harder no's. 
that we have had to, to give our time. And, and Stephen left uh, the room, and then he came back in later, and he said, Mom and Dad, I want to thank you because... I felt like I needed to press you hard for the sake of my relationship with Jay and the others. Uh, but I really wanted you to say no because I didn't think it was a good thing for me to go. So he thanked us for saying no. I Just at the point where you think, did we make the right decision? <laughs> and are we ruining the relationship for the college years to come or something like that? You know, he comes back and, I mean, that was a real that was a confirmation shocker. that it's okay <laughs> to say no when you think it should be no, even if they're about yeah. to graduate from high school. Yeah, your kids may actually be wanting you to say no. Yeah. And we have had, like, in dating relationships and things like that, um, where we've had code words that if you want, you know, us to come and get you, just uh, whatever. Mm -hmm. um, I think one of the things that, well, let me say a word about let me read Proverbs 23, and I'm sure there'll be some questions as we get into some of this more. But uh, Proverbs 23, verses 12 to 19, the spanking Proverbs passage, okay, the rod. Hear my son and be wise and direct, okay, did I start in the right place? What did I say? 12 to 19. 12, sorry. Okay, right. Apply your heart to instruction and your ear to words of knowledge. Do not withhold discipline from a child. If you strike him with a rod, he will not die. If you strike him with a rod, you will save his soul from Sheol. My son, if your heart is wise, my heart too will be glad. My inmost being will exalt when your lips speak what is right. Let not your heart envy sinners, but continue in the fear of the Lord all the day. Surely there is a future and your hope will not be cut off. Hear my son and be wise and direct your heart in the way. Now part of the reason I read not just the one verse is the two times in those passages that uses the word rod is surrounded in neighboring verses with the word heart. We have to be able to exercise the use of the rod in relationship to the heart. And I think that's uh, that's a very, that's a very child-centered view of spanking. It's not a parent. You know, parents have response. This is bringing the tension of these, you know, these mutually uh, different uh, responsibilities. And I think the question that can be raised, and there's been debate for a long time on this, and I'm sure there will be long after we're not here, um, does the word rod have to mean physical punishment? Or is the physical punishment use of the word rod an example of disciplining that could, in use, could include the rod, but doesn't necessarily have to? Okay? So do we take it literally that we must use the rod as the tool of discipline? Or do we say that is a tool in our arsenal of what we're doing? Arsenal is probably not a good word to, you know, get with the heart. <laughs> uh, but uh, so... Again, I'm not sure who said this because I didn't, I, I got the quote in another place I couldn't find because I didn't go to my office to try to find it. But uh, this is a great phrase. Spanking is a potent medicine that should be administered with great care by mature adults for the right purpose. Let me read that again. Spanking is a potent medicine that should be administered with great care by mature adults for the right purpose. So I think it's, there are certain things, ways we have to check and make sure before we use the rod. I'm not against it. I think it's as it being the only go-to and the only biblical way of disciplining and so on, I have some, some concerns um, about mm -hmm. that. And I know there's a lot of disagreement. Um, well, there's so much, that. there's so much we read and hear so much about uh, physical abuse and, um, you know, children who have been horribly, horribly harmed and abused. And so if you have a, a son or daughter-in-law that has been raised in that atmosphere, you certainly would not encourage them to use yeah. that form of corporal punishment. Yeah. I think that's why it was eliminated from schools, actually, perhaps because of um, 
the abuse of, of yep. that. Well, I think what are alternatives, and again, different children respond to different things. We virtually never had to spank Kristen, who was second after <laughs> Stephen. We spanked Stephen quite a bit. And Kristen was so traumatized by her brother being spanked that whenever we would tr correct her, I mean, she wasn't even able to say it, you know, clearly. She, she would say, don't panka my bama. That's don't spank my bottom. And she would burst into tears. We weren't even threatening spanking her. But she was sort of like, when she knew she had done something wrong and there was some discipline coming, she was crying out, don't spank my bottom, which, you know, was already a, she's already repenting and owning what she needed to own. And it was, uh, it was uh, actually, and, and then I, I will say uh, one of the most, significant moments uh, between Stephen and me, and I don't remember how old he was, I can remember what bedroom it was in and what house we were in. We lived in, in Cincinnati at the time. Um, I, uh, he, I had determined I was gonna spank him, and um, he, uh, he kept putting his hands over his backside to try to keep me from spanking him, and I kept getting more and more angry because he was doing that. And I, I, I gave him the hardest spanking I'd ever given him quickly after he moved his hands back one time. And I just, it was out of anger. Um, it was extremely hard. Um, and he was probably maybe 12 and somewhere in that, in that range. And um, we both started crying. And um, I was crying because I knew I'd spanked him out of, out of uh, anger and I asked him to forgive me. And he was crying, get this for an insight. He was crying because though he forgave me, he said, I forgive you, dad, but I'm afraid you won't ever forgive yourself. I mean, that was, that was huge. It was the last time I spanked him. Um, but you know, that was in the midst of his sin and mine, okay, um, that needed to be corrected and I needed to be corrected. That's where the, you know, we both admitted wrong and the power of the gospel comes in to heal and to set a better course toward the future. So, okay. Um, there are alternatives, you know, sometimes with little ones, it's just redirecting. Um, Beth is so good <laughs> with Stephen's youngest son, Paxton, who's five. At, uh, he's the sweetest kid except when he isn't and then he's like the most unsweet kid ever <laughs> um, and he gets stuck in these places where he's like this evil monster and he, you know, it's like he turns into a different person completely and, and as he keeps pressing Stephen and Katrina's buttons with that it's like you know they're worn out and you know we're refreshed grandparents who can you know engage the kid and Beth just he loves I mean, Beth has a way with Paxton, which is uh, just a beautiful thing to, Usually. to observe. <laughs> Usually, yeah. Yeah. Usually, yeah. Yeah, that's true. Usually. Yeah, we all have our, have our limits. Yeah, you have, again, the word arsenal, but you do have an arsenal <laughs> of things that you can redirect with. And Usually. I would say just one other thing before we um, take some questions, and then I want to allow about five minutes for a couple uh, closing comments. Um, the, there's something about God building into the way he made his creation and instructed his people about Sabbath rest. That the lack of it um, and the lack of building it in to our family life, I think creates an environment over time where it's really, really more and more difficult to be the kind of parents and children um, that we need to be. Yeah. Um, you know, work, um, there's, a, there's another side to work and it's called play, okay? One of the images in one of the minor prophets that I don't have the verse in front of me right now when it talks about sort of the, the new heavens, new earth, it talks about children freely playing in the streets, okay, as a picture of the coming kingdom in its fullness. And I think there's something about um, 
not building in space daily, weekly, in the summertime, whatever, where you really just have fun time as families. And there's so many, so many good things that Im, impose on that or take the place of that. And, you know, I, one of the things when we were in Cincinnati, there were, there were some families that ended up just being torn apart, partly because both the mother and father felt all four of their children needed to be involved in any possible activity they possibly could be involved in. And in the process of trying to make that happen for their kids, their marriage fell apart. And um, they didn't build in sort of nurturing time for their marriage, which is also very important in parenting, um, or just fun play times as a family. And um, I realize this, you know, for most, I mean, most of us, I hope you have the same experience I do, grandchildren think that their grandparents can do no wrong. Okay? At least for uh, a season. For a while, yeah, yeah. But I mean, it's like, the eagerness to see you and running out of the car and yelling in their name before they even, you know, the, you could hear them and, and coming and, and running and jumping and being excited and, you know, wanting you to play hide and seek or wanting you to, to play wiffle ball in the yard or whatever the case may be. But, you know, I had this, I realized one time when I was just overwhelmed with my work, which is quite easy to have happen, um, you know, I felt like I needed to respond to a couple of really significant emails right then when two of my grandchildren were asking me to play hide and seek and it was actually supposed to be my day off and I wasn't supposed to be doing work. And when, you, when I stopped to think about that, solve a problem at work that can wait till tomorrow or play hide and seek with my grandchildren. I mean, that's a no-brainer unless my patterns of this are so deeply ingrained that I can't even hear this call to delightful play with my grandchildren. And I think we need to um, have a, a, a good look at that. Now, you know, the world we live in right now with so many wild and crazy things going on makes that, makes that difficult, but in some ways the world we're living in now also maybe afford us a little more time um, you know, to, uh, to, to go, can't go to playgrounds in St. Louis because, you know, they're all yellow, Tape. you know, taped off sort of thing. But to go, you know, take a walk in the neighborhood, go run and play, all those various things that we may be able to do, um, partly because we're, we're at home a lot more than that we used to be. So Well, that reminds me, too. We were on vacation a few summers ago, um, probably up in Michigan, mm. and we had, we were on our way home, but we stopped in a little community to have lunch, and um, we were sitting down waiting for our uh, waitress to take our order and that kind of thing, and there was a family sitting at a table. <clears throat> it was a mother and a father and a, maybe a six-year-old child. Both the mom and dad are on their cell phones just doing this because they're waiting for their meal to come. And, and the little boy yeah. was trying desperately to have a conversation with either parent. And he's looking up at them lovingly and, you know, and doing this, you know, asking a question. And they were just scrolling through and reading and just ignoring him. And it, it just really um, impacted me because how many of us do allow our phones to override relationship? And we, we allow it to intrude in times that, that we shouldn't. And we were blessed not to have cell phones back in the day. I mean, the day I threw the meatball at Mark, it was because he was on our phone that was tied to the kitchen. Um, and that was a different matter. Now I can matter. walk outside, you know. But I'm now you, can't, you cannot escape your phone. And so that's another area to just be conscious about. Right. And... Um, try to and the solution in that setting where they could have had a nice family conversation and enjoyed a meal is not to give the six-year-old an ipad no which is where i think it's gone in the last several years that yeah. the resolve of my being able to be on my screen is to give the kids a screen now there's a place for kids to have a screen and, I, and some people are saying oh great i'm trying to limit the time for my kids to be on screen, and now the school district telling me that about four hours a day they're going to have to be on the screen. Okay, I mean that's a 
that's a challenge. I mean, it's a different kind of screen, of course, but so, yeah. Um, but I think um, we lack effectiveness sometimes because we've, we've somehow find this sense of uber responsibility that to live life on the edge of burnout is righteousness before God. Um, Dan Perrins, my brother-in-law, we served churches in Cincinnati across town, uh, overlap for about five years. And um, Dan and I would always talk on Monday morning on our day off, <clears throat> and here's how the conversation would go. And our congregations are about the same size. We'd compare how many people were in attendance, okay, and see who had the most. I mean, it was just sort of like, yeah, and how did how'd church go for you yesterday? Well, we always had to throw in how many people were present, okay? Um, and then we talk about how the previous week went, you know, and Dan would say, well, I think I, I, I think I put in about a 75 hour week last week. I said, well, that's nothing. I think I put in about an 80 hour week last week. Like, w should we be bragging about working that many hours a week, week after week after week? Um, and it just sort of became this, I am, I have more favor before God because I'm living my life on the edge of burnout more than you are. And, you know, God had to say, I don't think this is what, I mean, who's holding this universe and this church and your family and your life together? It's me, not you. Um, you can rest. Come to me if you're weary and heavy laden. Don't pile on more so you can tell Dan that you had more overworking righteousness than he did. Um, and part of it is we just don't apply the gospel fully to our lives, to our parenting, to our work life, to the you know, if there's no just um, laughter and playing together, then we need to maybe say, how can we, how can we make this happen? Um, and to capitalize on that when the little ones want to play with you all the time. And to, um, you know, if I could bring that back into, I mean, I'm working harder than I've ever worked as president of Covenant Seminary but I'm feeling really good about making space for playing with my grandchildren as part of my life calling right now. And if the board member Sam thinks differently, then um, I'll say, well, we can have a discussion, Sam, but I'm going to be right and you're going to be wrong. No. Uh, anyway, um, you all know Sam's on our board, Do, just doing a tremendous job in so many ways. And uh, I love the man dearly and thank him for his really wonderful work at the seminary. Okay, um, let's see. I think that's probably good for now. What are we, where are we on time? Okay, we've got about almost 20 minutes left before we hit the 11.45, so I'll save about three at the end. Questions? I know somebody's probably going to have a question here. Prime the pump. Okay. So um, obviously, uh, discipline looks different at different ages and stages. Um, uh, for some of us, it's a little bit easier to conceive of how to deal disciplinarily with itty bitties, but we kind of lose our way once they become teenagers. What are some things, uh, granting the fact that your you know, discipline and parenting is child specific? What are some things that, as you all have dealt with your kids as they grew up, and now you've got a preteen grandson and watching Steve and Katrina kind of do that, what are some things that have been proven effective in reaching their hearts as you've had to go through the process of disciplining teenagers especially? I think one thing is actually getting individual one-on-one -on -one time with them. Um, to go on dates with dad or mom or whatever, to, to be able to be, because increasingly it's not about a specific behavior at the moment that needs corrected. It's more about patterns that may be drifting in a direction they shouldn't or um, helping them think through issues and temptations they're facing. Um, so I think to have planned individual time, doing something they like, out of which meaningful conversations can take place. So that's sort of the proactive side of that. Um, I, do you have I have two illustrations from my own life. When I was in 
<coughs> excuse me, in middle school, um, there was a science test and I cheated on it and so did most of the class. And so the teacher sent a, a letter home to all the parents and there, was, there were problems with that. And when my father read that, he cried. And that to me spoke volumes. I didn't need to be disciplined because his tears were enough because I knew I had broken his heart. And then another time, um, I was 16 and I was arrested for climbing one of those huge green water towers. We were up on top. So um, They were going up to pray. We were going up to pray. The view was great, but you had to scale a big fence with barbed wire and, you know, and anyway, long story short, we saw the, the cops coming up the siren and we could watch them coming and couldn't get down in time or anything. Yeah. So we were arrested. So, um, and I was scheduled later in the summer to go to a, a young life camp out in Colorado. And, and so my parents, so I was a 16 year old. So my parents had to come up with something creative. How do you discipline a 16 year old who has arrested. done something? <laughs> it was mischievous, but it was illegal. So, um, so they, invited me into the conversation and, um, and I had to ask, uh, tell them what I thought would be restrictive for me. So I, had, I wasn't allowed to drive. I thought that would be a penalty for me. So I said, okay, well, if you just don't let me drive for you know, five weeks or whatever. And, um, and then, because uh, if I didn't do it, the other consequence was I wouldn't be able to go to this camp either. So my parents were um, thoughtful about how they applied discipline, and there were other things I don't even remember in that situation, what I, what I, um, the discipline that was meted out. But um, anyway, so as age appropriate, as kids do stupid things, and they always do, and we still do as adults, but um, just, you know, doing the age appropriate discipline for older, older kids. And, um, and then another thing for uh, teenagers, um, we had a high school principal that was a friend of ours, and um, he was actually the principal of our kids in Richmond, but um, he said, he suggested when your kids go out, you establish this before they go out, you set an alarm in your bedroom, your bedroom. For so the curfew. For their curfew. Mm -hmm. So they have to be home, and they have to come in, and they have to turn off that alarm um, so you know they're home. Yep. And I thought that was really good because that, that keeps you from Let having us go to, to sleep. Yeah. Then you don't have to mete out discipline because th that problem's already taken care of. So those are a couple of thoughts or ideas that come to my mind. It's, and again, I, it's, um, it, it's you know, like the one what I said with Stephen and Jay, it's what do they really, you know, what do they really want? What, what is it they really want to do? And finding that thing that you deny as a consequence and sometimes it's you know it's it's laying it out or I think as Beth was saying in her example you, you it always seemed weird in theory to say ask the child what they think their discipline should be but sometimes that does get a good thing in the mix um, in it cuts down of, on re rebellion in, in terms yeah. of your parental relationship, I think, yeah. to, to bring your child into it. Yeah. Got a question over here? Thank you for coming today. Yeah. It's been very humbling and orienting for us. Um, this is my wife, Ashley, and we have three kids, and my children are nine, seven, and four. And so we're, you said vipers and covenant diapers. I love that, but I feel like it's vampires and covenant <laughs> diapers where they just <laughs> suck you emotionally. But, um, and you, you alluded to this, but I'd be curious. I remember I went to a local Christian high school here, and the Bible teacher was doing chapel one day, and I don't remember a lot of the chapels, but he gave this illustration talking about familial dynamics, and he said, if I was on a boat, he had two sons. He said, son, and he, he was giving this to the chapel, and he said, if I'm on a boat and it capsizes, and all my family is adrift in the water, and I can save one person, he said to his sons, I'll save my wife, because I can make more sons. <laughs> And so, as I've gotten older, that has always stuck with me. And what I've noticed in marriage is that empty nesters, there's this resurgence of divorce. And there's a loss 
of the relationship that he was illustrating between the husband and the wife and being a primary relationship and investing in it and maintaining that relationship so you don't become empty nesters as strangers. I would love to hear kind of y'all's insights on the intentionality of the husband-wife relationship because you've talked often about to the kids and to the grandparents, which is hugely insightful of how you deal with the parents. But if you have comments on that, I'd appreciate it. Yeah, that's a really good question, a really good point. Um, I think the <clears throat> there's all kinds of things in a relationship, even to the parenting of children, that the baseline and the nurturing of the relationship between husband and wife is vital to. Um, you know, being on the same page with different things, um, just is there delight in our relationship? Do we take enough time? And granted, there are so many pressures and so hard to do, and I think this is partly why how one of the things the broader family of God's people in, a, in the body of Christ can help, you know, we see this at the seminary a lot where people living on campus, you've got parents taking kids for an evening so other parents can go out on a date and vice versa. So that seems to be something that, you know, how can we help one another in creating space for us to nurture our our um, relationship with each other. I think that's that's a vital thing um, for the children, not only for the health and, and well-being of the family. And a lot of times, when we sinfully respond to them, it's out of a. It may be we're upset with our spouse, and so we have to give that priority. I agree with that. Um, I think we also have to help our children understand that mommy and daddy are more important to each other, or if you're, they're teenagers, they're not saying mommy and daddy anymore. Um, and even, because uh, we're setting a pattern for what their marriage will be like in the future. And that's part of that. What do we, what goes forward generationally that's good? What goes forward generationally that's not good? And we have to be, we have to be thinking, I, I, I think it was probably Dobson many years ago saying something about from the day they're born you're preparing them to be sent out and I think that's we have to keep the end of leaving father and mother uh, through that time that we're, we're, we're getting their family ready at least from our family system into whom they will marry and have children by God's grace so I, I think and how can we you know I think our 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 children have been, were sensitive fairly early on, like about the age yours are going into the teen years, of um, wanting to help us have time together. So you, the children can participate in that, um, or older ones being willing to watch the younger ones and give us a chance to walk around when we wouldn't necessarily go too many blocks away, okay? Um, so I think let, have the children help see this as a priority and help make it happen for you. I mean, that can be a creative sort of way that you're both benefiting from it, but also instructing them and nurturing them toward a future prioritization. And I think, I think that the building blocks in a marriage, again, in a Christian marriage, are um, praying together and not having secrets um, and being open and confession and seeking forgiveness, those are building blocks. And you do that in a way that your children watch because they watch everything you do. We watched everything our parents did. Um, and, and they see how we relate to one another. And again, I can't stress enough the no secrets um, because a relationship has to be open and it has to be honest. Because when you have secrets, then you have betrayal. And when you have betrayal, you have broken trust. And when you have broken trust, you have just everything awful. And that's the end of a marriage. And so Christ comes to redeem that. And trust can be rebuilt. I work with women whose husbands have sexual addictions. And it's be this is the greatest betrayal in a marriage that can happen. And um, these women have endured the worst betrayal and yet they come to a group that I lead to help them to help their husband 
and they realize they can't do anything to help him, he has to come to that realization himself that he needs help, that kind of a thing. But it, it doesn't always have to be the man that has the sexual relationship. It can be the women. But, but um, just um, saving the marriage, that's why no secrets and prayer. And, and that's what the Lord requires of us, isn't it? To be um, forthright with him because he knows everything about us anyway. And so then your children see that. And then they see that this marriage can endure even these kinds of difficult things. A marriage can be saved. It, it doesn't have to always lead to divorce. But each partner has to be willing to do the hard work. And if the husband isn't willing to work on his stuff, that marriage isn't going isn't to last. So those are building blocks that I think are essential and, and learning to pray. Because when you pray before the Lord, you don't hold back, do you? because you're, you're honest. You're expressing your honest thoughts and desires. And um, so that's how open and honest communication takes place in a marriage. So if you, don't, if you haven't been doing that in your relationship, please start. It doesn't have to be complicated. It can be simple. Thank you. One of the things that, that helped Linda and myself uh, with children was having Bible studies where Linda was with other women at night and on Tuesday night I better get home by six o'clock mm -hmm. so she could get to that Bible study and they prayed and they started the Bible but the sharing of lessons learned and struggles and the prayer for that really was significantly helpful Friday morning I had a men's Bible study where we did essentially the same thing but to hear I think too many parents think they're in this by themselves and have to relearn every lesson can you talk about how the church can help families learn from one another? Yeah, I think um, we, I th let me go bigger picture first and then come back and apply to it. I think that we, we in Christian circles with sort of the, you know, anti-family things and sort of wanting to, to, to say we, we want to preserve the, uh, the family um, even to the point of um, absenting ourselves from being with other Christians um, in a way that we can almost turn the nuclear family into an idol. And we both rob ourselves and others of being engaged in the family of God which I think is, is primary, okay? Um, in Ephesians 4, it talks about several core identity things. First of all, I'm in Christ. I've been transferred out of the kingdom of darkness, Colossians 1, into the kingdom of God's Son. Secondly, I'm in the body of Christ. Um, those two things do not change for all eternity. I'm in Christ, I'm in the body of Christ, okay? Um, the... The third thing in the passage is everyone's given a gift and then there are some people who are pastors and leaders and so on. But if you think about, um, there won't be marriage and giving and marriage in heaven. Okay? But we'll still be in the body of Christ and with the people of God. So particularly in training of past, future pastors and ministry leaders, we have to work this through. What, what is the priority? Because sometimes ministry so intrudes on the pastor's life um, and family, that we have to have some correction of that. But, you know, sometimes it's like Friday night's my, my date night, and it doesn't matter if someone's in an automobile accident and they're in the emergency room, it's my date, light, date night. I say, you know, there are exceptions to your date night, okay? Um, but I think um, w what I've come to see is my core identity is in Christ. My next core identity is I'm part of the people of God, the body of Christ. And my first responsibility within the body of Christ is to my immediate family. But every believer has responsibilities to everyone else that they're potted with, okay, I guess now, uh, within the body of Christ. So how do I help others and others help me in this primary calling we have with our immediate family? Um, and I think in some ways, quite apart from the current time where we are more isolated, I think we've become increasingly isolated over the years. Um, 
I was just reflecting on when we used to go to Presbytery meetings back in Great Lakes Presbytery, we always stayed in people's homes. It was like nobody stays in people's homes now. It's, got, it's a hotel motel um, sort of thing. And that's just a, I think that's maybe a reflection of not being as outward focused, even as a family. How do we include other people in our immediate family? Those who don't have a family. And we say about churches, we're family oriented and we want to be there for families and be a family to those who don't have one. Um, what does that look like? How do we help one another? And I think it's, um, you know, most churches still have something when somebody gets sick, you get meals to them somehow. Um, you know, that's an expression of that. But I think we, you know, in small group settings can be places where we know those deeper needs and we can be there for each other. But I don't know, I, I have this sense, and I don't think it's just because we've been empty nesters for a while now, but um, it's almost like we're retreating a bit, and maybe part of it is we haven't built this play and refreshment and Sabbath rest into our day-to-day -day living. We don't have any space left for ourselves, let alone to be there for someone else. And, you know, I think, you know, one of the things that you know, sort of the Sabbatarian view of the past that isn't present too much even in the PCA in terms of very specific practices all day long was to be available to care for people and to do things with other families or um, to visit those who are shut in as we, you know, the shut-ins that we, we, we historically have called it. So I think part of it is, a, is to say, I know my responsibilities to my immediate family, but what are my responsibilities to other families and single people in the church? Um, and different stages. I mean, one of the things that sort of I remember in churches, it's like people who once their kids got out of the house and you're trying to find people to do nursery duty in the church and churches that are burgeoning with all kinds of little ones. And their answer is, been there, done that, don't ask me. <laughs> and it's like, well, you now have some space and time and energy um, space and time. Space and time. <laughs> you don't have the energy? <laughs> right. So I think part of it is maybe revealing or exposing other things that are out of order in our lives that just has space for our own rest and refreshment, but space to minister to others in practical ways. Hospitality. Yeah. Yes. Parker. So, uh, again, thank you all for being here. My question really has to do with uh, how, I'd love to hear from your experience and some principles, but when we parent our children, how do we discern that they're ready to come make a profession of faith? How do we, how do we discern, you know, how did y'all do that? Um, what are some principles, some things that you've learned through that? That'd be helpful. Yeah. Well, we could take a page out of the pastors and elders Facebook page and uh, it's an ongoing topic there. Um, yeah, I think too often in Presbyterian circles, we have identified knowledge and the capacity to communicate the knowledge I have doctrinally with maturity and relationship with Christ. And I think there's a minimal understanding that needs to take place in the lives of our children about who God is, who we are, who Christ is, what he's done, what it means to have a relationship with him, and what is being communicated in the sacrament of the Lord's Supper. I don't think you have to be 12 or older for that to happen. I don't know what your policy here is, and I you know, can step on a lot of toes, but I think there's a, what's an age-appropriate understanding of a living faith relationship with Christ? And that's, where you, that's why you have elders, okay, as you discern what that is. Or what we would do in, in uh, churches I've served is when the parents felt that the child was ready to make a profession of faith, they would notify the, one of the pastors. And then we would figure out which pastor and which elder had the closest relationship with the family, and they would go and visit the family and have cookies and milk or whatever the case may be, 
and just have a conversation. It isn't going through a series of examination. It's just in the course of a conversation, asking these basic questions. In some ways, when, when I've been involved in that, we've been more thorough in our examination of a seven-year-old than we have of people when they come to join the church. Now, you, don't, you expect them at the right cognitive development age to be part of sort of a, we call it the PCA doctrine class. You didn't have to take that before you could become a communing member, but you took that when you reached that age. And just because you took it didn't mean that you necessarily became a communing member. So it's discernment that isn't one size fits all, which makes some people nervous. But I think um, for people who have a living vital faith in Christ that are, that are you know, uh, Jonathan Edwards believed a four-year-old was ready to come to the Lord's Supper. And if Jonathan Edwards felt a four-year-old was ready to come to the Lord's Supper, and John Gerson is the one that told us that, um, you know, the, the little viper with the covenantal diapers, you know, sort of thing. But that was crab and dom, but uh, Gerson emphasized the little vipers a lot. But at any rate, um, then... And, and I've admitted in churches I've been in uh, as young as, as five and six year olds um, who just had a, I remember asking, so when we take of the bread and the cup, is that Jesus? No, Jesus is in heaven with the Father. Um, and the Holy Spirit's with us. It's like this five year old was like saying things. I'm not sure all the elders in the room understood you know, the physical presence of, she actually was saying, he has a body, but he's in heaven with the Father. And I'm thinking, there are a lot of people that don't really understand the ongoing full humanity of Jesus, but this five-year-old captured in relationship to the Lord's Supper, I thought, I'm not sure I'll have you give a message in the sermon this week, but at any rate, um, it's, uh, I think we have to just, because the Spirit works how and when he will. Well, and different children have a different maturity level too. Some are mature when they're much younger and others, whoa, it's really delayed. Yeah. Um, and also I think too, um, in the Catholic church, the age of eight is the age of reasoning. So that's sort of, they, from what I understand, they, they have observed that that's an age where a child can really begin to grasp some reasoning too. So, but mm -hmm. it depends on the individual too. But I think to, you know, that, that, you know, a lot of times people say, you know, when the, to desire to eat of the bread and the cup is not necessarily just because they want physical food. And if God's spirit is working and nurturing them and, um, you know, they, they see that there's something special about that for people who love Jesus and they love Jesus too. And maybe there's something there for me. So it isn't necessarily to be dismissed, it isn't necessarily to be acted on either. It needs conversation and interaction. So that's a, that can be a challenging one. I remember uh, one time in, in the church in Cincinnati also that there were, there were, um, <coughs> there was a couple, he'd been an elder in another PCA church, um, and their children met with the session and um, we were, two of the three, we were not convinced really had a genuine understanding and faith. And these were, they were about 11 or 12 and like 11 to 14 maybe. And we, as another one of those, we decided to say they weren't ready yet, realizing we could lose this family. And the family said to us afterwards, you're absolutely right. What they communicated to you, there was no sense. There was no way you should have said yes to that. So it's another, so like Stephen's saying, thanks for saying no. The parents were saying, thanks for saying no. Mm -hmm. So you have to do hard, I mean, when you enter into this, the challenges of discernment that doesn't fit some unified pattern defined by how old you are, you create new challenges. But isn't it a greater challenge to have a seven, eight, nine, 10, 11 year old who is fully trusting in Christ being forbidden from having a means of grace in the Lord's Supper. So you have to, you know, eldership is messy sometimes, isn't it? Family life is too. Where are we? We're close to time probably. But oh, we are past time, sorry. Yeah. Would you join me in thanking Mark and Beth for coming and sharing with us? Thank you. And Mark, would you pray for us and pray for us especially in our parenting and grandparenting, yes. please? Yes. 
Father, we thank you for this time that we could be together this morning, for those who have been watching in live stream as well, and for this month of uh, thinking through and praying through and learning from others and one another what it means to um, parent and grandparent in a way that's centered in the gospel of Jesus and how you parent us. Father, I pray for each one here and for across the congregation, um, all the family systems at work and coming together in what at times uh, looking at the church as a family system is just so complex and at times so dysfunctional. Um, we just cry out to you for your, you to pour your mercy and grace that you would help people to open their hearts and say, Lord, what do I need to learn? What do I need to confess? How can I, how can I be a better parent or grandparent or supportive of those who are? in the life of the church. So we pray that you would push back against the, the, the sin that goes forward from generation to generation, that you would restrain it and remove it, and that you would pour your Spirit's power upon the, the gospel advancement happening in families uh, so that it would just be more and more. Lord, we need you. We cry out to you. We thank you for the privilege we have of had the chance to be parents and grandparents um, to um, steward these children you've given us um, and to, to co-labor with you in them coming to know you and love you and live for you and raise up their own families that would do the same. Help us now, we pray, as we go our separate ways. Uh, help us as we prepare to worship you tomorrow. And I do pray, even for those here and watching now, um, that you would open our hearts to trust you enough to actually find room for rest and play in our lives. Um, that we would have space for family and space for others outside our family and be a real blessing to one another. In Jesus' name, amen.